Good evening. I hereby call to order the action session of the Board of School Commissioners for Thursday, December 14th. The colors will be posted this evening by the color guard from Northwest <coughs> Community High School, led by cadre advisor Sergeant Master Sergeant Thomas R. Brown. Colors are presented by Sergeant First Class Rache Jones, Cadet Corporal Wasso, Cadet Major Anthony Brown, Cadet Command Sergeant Major Victor Esquivel, Cadet Corporal Anish Tav Riviera, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Annie Acevedo will leave us, lead us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise for the presentation of colors. Thank you to the color guard from Northwest High School. Mr. Mulholland, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Arnold? Here. Commissioner Bentley? Secretary Gore? Here. Commissioner Hoops? Here. Commissioner Moore? Vice President O'Connor? Here. President Sullivan? Here. Thank you, Mr. Mulholland. We will now adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting. The agenda was reviewed on Tuesday and reflects all necessary modifications or additions. Reviewing the modified agenda, are there any requests for changes to the agenda as presented? Any suggestions? Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The agenda is adopted. We will now proceed to section two. This evening's student performance will be presented by the Shortridge High School Woodwind Ensemble. Bringing us a holiday-inspired performance are student performers Sterling Moore, Ariana Mitchell, Hannah Penrod, Trent Stokem. They are directed by Tarion Cooper. Please welcome our student performers from Shortridge High School.
Thanks again to our student performers. We will now move to section three, opening comments. Does any commissioner wish to offer comments at this time? Thank you. We will now receive public comment from those individuals who have signed up to offer comments to the board this evening. I will remind our speakers that you are allowed three minutes to offer comments to the board. A timer will start when you begin and I ask that you briefly conclude your remarks when you hear the timer go off. Comments should be directed to the board collectively, should be respectful, and should not address a topic that might be of a confidential nature or that would compromise the impartiality of the board. I will also remind our speakers that while the board is happy to receive your comments, we will not respond or answer questions at this time. Please come to the podium and begin your comments when your name is called. Mr. Grammelsbacher. The first general public comment this evening is Crystal Cow, if present. Second on the list is Leilani Molina. Good evening. <clears throat> my name is Leilani Molina. I have spent time at my daughter's school. When asked, I would be willing to, um, sorry. When asked if I would be willing to tell you why my husband and I chose Global Prep Academy, I didn't hesitate. I heard about the school from a friend of a friend who thought that Global Prep would be a good fit for us. Um, I tend to speak a lot of English at home and noticed that my three girls were speaking English most of the time and couldn't understand when either my husband or I would speak to them in Spanish. I want them to speak and write English, but we also want them to be connected to our culture and have the ability to speak and write in Spanish. Our daughter spends most of her day at school. When I found out about a school that teaches in English and in Spanish, we were hoping it would be a good fit. It had been more than a good fit. My daughter, Leon, is, a fir is in first grade and she is learning so well in both languages. She comes home and talks about her day, teaches Spanish to her younger sister. Me and my husband noticed that they all speak clear English and they all speak more Spanish now. We live in Wayne Township, um, so my younger daughters go attend preschool there. We are very happy with the school and we will send our youngest daughters to Gro Global Prep Academy when they start kindergarten. I like all the teachers, but I really admire um, and respect Maestro Ciro. He is an excellent teacher. He commands attention, the students, re the students respect him so there is order in his class, but the students can still feel how much he cares about them. When I volunteered in the classroom, sometimes I know that, that all the children are figuring things out on their own. They are learning and problem solving. Some, something else I like about the school is that they introduce all the students to a lot of different cultures. Uh, for one example is Christmas. Instead of just one celebration, they celebrate several, several cultures and traditions from around the world. The students also try new things, eat foods that reflect cultures around the world. I feel welcome, as I said, I have spent a lot of time at the school. I have volunteered with different decorations, helped coordinate events, volunteered during events, and brought in, for once, bread and hot chocolate. I was really worried about my daughters being able to connect and understand our culture as they got older and GPA has changed things for the good. From what I understand, you helped Global Prep possible. Thank you. We love Global Prep. Thank you. The next speaker this evening is Christina Smith, please. Good evening. Um, I have a parent of two kids here in IPS and also I live on the near west side. Friday I had the pleasure to meet with several families from School 63. These parents were told that they would be included in the process of choosing an operator to take over their school, but this, as has happened time and time again, has not been the case. 
Matchbook Learning has been chosen to take over this struggling school. It's not been voted on, but they've already posted positions for hiring. Matchbook utilizes blended learning, meaning the students spend a great amount of time daily using computers or iPads in place of instruction by a teacher. Why has a blended learning model been chosen? There's very little research for K-12 students on their outcomes. The Economic Policy Institute has described blended learning as a low budget operation that relies on young, inexperienced teachers rather than more veteran, experienced, expensive faculty that reduces the curriculum to a near exclusive focus on reading and math that replaces teachers with online learning and digital applications for a significant portion of the day. Further, they state that blended learning schools are supported by investment banks, hedge funds, and venture capital firms that in turn aim to profit. The curricular model is shaped not simply by what is good for kids, but also in part by what will generate the biggest profits for their investors and fuel the company's ambitious growth plan. So let's look specifically at matchbook learning. In 2012, they opened up a middle school in Newark, New Jersey. They expanded to high school shortly after. The test scores for Merritt Preparatory Charter School were among the lowest in the state as were its scores for student growth. At the end of last school year, the state of New Jersey shut the school down, leaving 380 students with subpar education and now looking for a new school. Matchbook then failed to pay teachers and staff for the final two months of work. In Detroit, they took over failing charter school, Michigan Technical Academy. Test scores dropped. When the contract was up this past summer, Matchbook cut and run again, leaving students high and dry. The school was incredibly in debt after spending, eight, or after spending $16 million in just two years on buildings. Again, leaving teachers and staff without being paid. Magically, the funds to pay off teachers and staff was found around the same time that the Mind Trust announced Matchbook Learning's Sanjin George and Amy Swan would relocate to Indianapolis after being picked as Mind Trust Fellows and then given an innovation school. I would like Dr. Farabee and the board to explain to the parents of 63 and the community why is IPS allowing a company with a terrible track record that uses unproved and low budget models to replace real teaching take over a school? Thank you. The next speaker for general public comment is Lloyd Bryant, please. Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to engage the school board, Dr. Kaferby. Um, the arts program at Arsenal Tech. Personally, I believe one way to engage students in the K-12 experience is through academics, athletics, and the arts. Research shows that five great ways of, to enhance students is through the performing arts. Higher, higher academic achievement, confidence and self-presentation skills, medium, for self-expression, problem solving, and perseverance, empathy, and compassion. The band, choir, and theater productions at Arsenal Tech over the years have been a mainstay for Arsenal Tech and the Arsenal Tech community. This past Saturday, I had a cameo appearance in the all-staff theater production of The Elf. Our goal at Arsenal Tech is to develop the whole child. I personally was a three-sport athlete who played the alto sax, though not very good but I understand the need to have a well-rounded student as we prepare for college and career. Moving forward, the plan of action will be to put the best talented staff in front of our students daily. Increase student involvement in all facets of the arts program at Tech. And I really want to thank you guys for giving me this opportunity to bring some clarity to what the plan of action is moving forward for Arsenal Tech Arts Program. Thank you. I'll recall if President Crystal Cal, please. That concludes our general public comment this evening. Thank you. Having received opening comments from the board and the public, we will now proceed to the consent agenda. The items included on the consent agenda were reviewed at our agenda review session on Tuesday and reflect all necessary modifications. So I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is for the board to hold a project and preliminary hearing on the proposed construction project. 
If you are interested in speaking at the hearing, please make sure you have signed the sign-in sheet at the back of the room, which should include your name and address. After a presentation by the administration and its advisors, there will be an opportunity for the public to make comments about the project. At the hearing, we will ask that each person limit their comments to three minutes and that the topic be limited to the proposed projects under consideration. The notice of this preliminary determination hearing was published as legally required on December 1, 2017 in the Indianapolis Star and Court and Commercial Record. In addition, it was published in the Indianapolis Recorder. At this time, I will ask our board administrator to explain the purpose of this hearing. Pursuant to Indiana Code 2026-7-37, before a school corporation may spend more than $1 million to build, repair, or alter a school building that will be financed by a lease or bonds, it must hold a public hearing at which explanations of the potential value of the project to the school corporation and community are given. Similarly, pursuant to Indiana Code 6-1.1-20-3.5, a school corporation must hold two public hearings and adopt a resolution to preliminarily determine to issue bonds or enter a lease for a project which will obligate the school corporation to pay more than $2 million in total project costs. These public hearings and the adoption of, re of resolutions are the beginning of the legal process. These resolutions establish, establish the maximum financial terms for the proposed project. We will now hear from Dr. Faraby about the process of determining and communicating the project to the community and the need for the project. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this evening, uh, staff will provide information on the need and the why for what's being proposed as relates to the preliminary hearing for a referendum. Uh, tonight, you get an opportunity to hear from Ahmed Young, Chief of Staff, who will go into details on the context of the ask. Uh, we also have President Amba and Associates that will provide additional financial information. It's important to note that there are two driving factors uh, associated with the need and the request for additional funding. Uh, one being the side of our investment. Uh, the district has made an effort to ensure that we address uh, compensation for our employees and our teachers. And over time, uh, IPS has had frozen salaries for staff, and we have been addressing that over the last uh, three or four years to ensure that we remain competitive with the need to ensure that we attract and retain exceptional educators and staff for our schools to support our students and families. With that, as noted on the presentation, IPS has invested uh, over $8.8 million annually uh, since school year 2015-16 to the current 2017-18 school year to provide raises for staff and also to ensure that those are true raises by providing staff cost-neutral uh, health benefits. We're one of the few organizations or corporations that has maintained such benefits as a penny a pay period for health benefits and associated with dental and vision. And so we're excited what we're able to offer our employees so they can realize a true raise. On the other side of the coin, the district at the same time has received significantly less funding in three streams, uh, our local funding, our state funding, and federal funding. On the local lens, the district receives almost $17 million less annually uh, due to property tax caps. On the federal side, the district receives about 14 $2 million less in federal funding compared to the 2010-2011 school year. And then finally, our state funding. Uh, the district receives less per pupil, which is approximately $300 per pupil, which results in about 5.88% less in funding per pupil basis for this current year of the 2017-18 school year, which is approximately $10 million less in funding. So again, coupled together, our investment in our employees to ensure that we're competitive to attract and retain the best for our students and our families and reduce funding, there's a need to ensure that we have additional resources in the years to come. It's important to note what's being requested includes a referendum ask for capital and operating dollars, and Ahmed Young will provide the context on what's being requested, but it's also important to note that the district, during a time of receiving less funding and supporting our employees through raises, 
and cost neutral benefit has also taken steps to ensure that we're fiscally responsible with the resources that we do have and has reduced funding significantly in a number of areas, which we'll highlight prior to the additional information as relates to what's being asked of the community. Thank you, Dr. Ferby. Again, my name is Ahmed Young, and it's an honor for you, for you all to afford this opportunity for the administration to discuss this really important topic. Uh, Dr. Ferby mentioned $8.8 .8 million as it relates to investing in our people. Now, that's the tip of the iceberg as it relates to the type of strategic decisions that the, the administration has made over the last several years. As you can see on the presentation above, you see four particular elements that, uh, that outline some of the investments that we've made over the last several years. And I'll start, I'll start with one in particular, uh, the selling of the Coca former Coca-Cola bottling plant as a one-time source of revenue in excess of $12 million, also which allowed us to outsource the bus fleet maintenance. A second element is the right-sizing of IPS central office, uh, which allowed us to reduce expenditures um, in excess of $5 million. A third element of that also includes the selling of the PR Mallory Ford building for redevelopment. Um, now you see these, these three thus far. One of the things that doesn't just jump off the paper immediately is the impact that it has on the local economy. And that's something that we need to make sure that we articulate very clearly. Um, also, refinancing the, the district's debt portfolio, making sure that we're taking truly advantage of lower interest rates and saving approximately $1.5 million a year. To continue that, uh, we've also made other strategic investments, so investing in not only our people, but our places as well, and thinking about how we're leveraging those assets appropriately. We've recently listed the FMD property for sale and sold three properties for an estimated $1.5 million in one-time estimated revenue. Also sold the unused school facilities to realize $1.15 million in one-time revenue for the district, while also spurring, once again, local redevelopment. We also sold the CIRT, the CERT building, Center for Instructional Radio and Television, uh, for $1.1 million in one-time revenue. And finally, also leasing facilities to education partners, uh, capturing more than $700,000 in annual uh, revenue. So these are some of the strategic decisions that we've made over the last several years, while also experiencing, like Dr. Farabee said, these multi-tiered drops in funding at the state level, the local level, and the federal level, which presents the case for where we are now. We're in a position where, because of what we've laid out already, we need to think about uh, strategic actions moving forward for the next several years and making sure that we're really thoughtful about how we're serving our families, our students, and the city of Indianapolis. Ultimately, uh, we're asking you all to consider um, your support, your guidance, to propose a uh, referendum, uh, particularly two referendum. Uh, funny enough, when I was up here last, this thing didn't want to work before, and now it's very sensitive. That's how things work out. But ultimately, we're asking you all to consider a referendum. And at the most basic level, a referendum is uh, posing a public question to the uh, general public on a ballot. On a ballot, And we're seeking to uh, put two referenda on the May 2018 ballot, particularly, and I'll start with the operating referendum. An operating referendum is an opportunity for us to think strategically about how we're leveraging and making sure that we have the necessary funds to, uh, to capture the day-to-day activities that a district compri is comprised of. So teacher salaries, uh, supplies, uh, minor building maintenance, all these things that take place on a day-to-day -day basis that we don't really think about uh, consistently. So what we're proposing potentially is uh, having a tax levy, uh, 59 cents per $100 of assessed value placed on the May 2018 ballot as a question to the general public. Uh, this will afford us the opportunity to truly invest in our people uh, and our, those individuals that spend uh, so much time and energy and mental capacity to serve our students and families, our teachers, our food service workers, our transportation workers, uh, central service workers, all these individuals that have dedicated years of not only training but blood, sweat, and tears to serve our students and families. So being able to offer them a cost of living adjustment annually of up to 2%, also maintaining what Dr. Farabee mentioned earlier, 
cost-neutral health benefits as well. Then a third element of that potentially is making sure that we're truly able to maintain and uh, execute on our vision for exceptional special ed services for all of our students that, are, that, that is, requires that attention. So with a $0.59 cent per $100 assessed value over the course of eight years, there's a potential opportunity to receive up to, at the maximum level, $92 million on an annual basis. And how will we utilize those particular funds? There are five buckets, essentially, that I can break down. Uh, first bucket, and which is appropriately the largest bucket, is compensation. Again, that's compensation to make sure that we're not only attracting talented individuals, <clears throat> Excuse me, but we're most importantly retaining those talented individuals that are uh, dedicating their time and energy to serve our students and family. So compensation is the biggest bucket in excess of 70% of that $92 million allocation. Uh, and then you break that down even further, you have transportation and uh, you have building and equipment maintenance as well as services and supplies. And transportation and compensation, pr pretty obvious, so I'll break down uh, the other buckets a little bit more, and I'll start with uh, building and equipment. There are three buckets that would utilize at least, five, at the most, $5 million annually. That includes minor, minor building repairs, furniture and equipment, and informational, information technology hardware. That's one bucket. Another bucket also includes services and supplies, those operating supplies that we need to make sure that we're actually servicing our students and maintaining our high quality of work purchase services, utilities and phone services, and other services like uh, risk management insurance and other types of services and charges. That's the operating side. On the more visible side for many of us are, the, uh, are our places, making sure that we have the necessary facilities to truly uh, serve our students and make sure that we can take pride in the, what we're walking in on a day-to-day -day basis. So the capital referendum will seek to fund or generate $200 million to fund the My IPS Safety, Security, and Technology Project, which will call for potentially a local property tax levy of no more than $0.13 cents per $100 of assessed value. Uh, so how will we ultimately use these funds? We'll A, make sure that we're giving all of our IPS-owned school facilities the TLC that they need and have been ignored in some instances for over a long period of time. Uh, we'll also address deferred maintenance and invest in energy efficient technology. Uh, but to break it down even further, uh, so ultimately we have 63 school sites, uh, which includes approximately 2,500 classrooms in the district and 35 schools that require uh, more than $1 million worth of maintenance and TLC. Uh, all schools will also receive exterior lighting for energy efficiency and security, which gains more than a million dollars in annual savings in classroom fixtures alone, with additional savings gained through technology controls in hallway office and gymnasium lighting. Additionally, all schools will receive hardened exterior for passive security, improved classroom doors and intruder locks for safety, new key systems for building entry and exiting, exterior door renovation or replacement for security. Uh, there will be an increased number of digital cameras, DVRs, new emergency radios. All elementary schools will receive port in place surface for ADA accessible playgrounds. And again, once again, very sensitive. Uh, ultimately, we're approaching this with a high level of sensitivity, but also recognizing that this is a need. Uh, and I say that uh, with a high degree of, of seriousness. Without the referenda funds, we will face potentially uh, hiring freeze, once again, for teachers and staff, uh, reduce some educational programs for our students, reduce the quality of special ed services, though maintaining compliance with state and federal law, also continue to defer building maintenance, and then reduce transportation services. Our goal, ultimately, is to make sure that our students receive the highest quality education that they're entitled to. And in order to do that, it, we have to pursue this referenda on the operating and capital side. Over the last several years, as Dr. Ferby laid out the larger context, uh, over the last several years, several Marion County districts right here in the city of Indianapolis have pursued referenda. And we need to make sure that we're not only competitive, but even beyond competition, we need to make sure we're truly serving our students and family. And most importantly, as the final element, 
Uh, we need to make sure that we're, we've leveraged the smart investments that we've made over the last several years and continue to be effective and efficient stewards of taxpayer money. Thank you. Um, one moment. We will now hear from Brock um, Bowsher. Or do you have a question for I'm so sorry. Commissioner O'Connor, yes. So, Mr. Chairman, when you referenced the um, taking the, sort of the sale of excess properties and the economic impact of that, I presume you mean by that what we've taken is properties that were not taxed or tax exempt, and they will be back on the tax rolls as developed private properties. Precisely. And we, I don't know if we have that in our numbers, but sort of what we can expect those parcels to return in, in property taxes, but that might be something as we look forward to add to our information. I'll make note of that. It's Thank not you, as significant, I know. I agree. Thank you. We will now hear from Brock Bowser, our financial advisor, about how the proposed projects will be financed, as well as information about the effect on the typical property taxpayer. As Brock come forward, I just wanted to take a moment to underscore the importance of uh, the property has been disposed, uh, we actually also benefit annually of about $700,000 of expenses that we no longer pay associated with operating those facilities, such as utilities and the like, which is also just another benefit to the district in terms of cost savings and efficiency. Welcome, sir. Yep. Yep. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Brock Bowsher, Madam President, Dr. Farabee, uh, Board Commissioners. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to be back here again tonight to uh, discuss this very important topic, to expand upon some of the things you heard that uh, Mr. Ahmed Young mentioned and highlight some things that uh, are some considerations going forward for the IPS School District. As I mentioned, my name is Brock Bauscher. Uh, I've been working with Mr. Young for a number of months on this project. Uh, I would like to also introduce Mr. Dustin Daly, one of our staff consultants who has assisted with this project. Uh, the gentleman the other evening, Mr. Todd Samuelson, is not able to attend tonight. He sends his regrets. He had a, another meeting to attend. So stuck with me, but uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here. Two, two topics we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, we're going to highlight some of the trends and projections for the operating referendum considerations and the capital referendum considerations as well. And we'll bring that home with what we expect or estimate the taxpayer impact to be for the IPS school district. So getting started with the projections, you always need a baseline or a set of assumptions to project out. And I want to highlight some of those projections, what we base our assumptions off of. On the revenue side, as we project out on student enrollment, we assume stable student enrollment working with Mr. Weston Young and his team. And we expect a decline in special ed enrollment as well. That we factored into the funding formula through the Department of Education and helped establish our projections. In addition to that, we assumed no additional state and local revenue based upon the 2017 numbers, just because we don't know what, how the economy is going to trend here in the coming years. So we established that we assume no additional revenue for state and revenue sources. Property tax revenue, I think a, a very common term you've heard in this community is property tax caps and the impact to the school districts and other local units. That will continue to challenge IPS and the property tax revenue available as we'll highlight some of those trends in the charts as well. On the expenditure side, we assume 2% modest inflationary increases from now through 2026. And the reason for that is uh, we wanted to keep within what a lot of the local businesses are experiencing with their inflationary increases. I do want to highlight that you heard uh, Mr. Ahmed Young talk about an 8% projection on medical insurance, and we did assume an 8% increase over the next three years, but ultimately 2% uh, past that point on total expenditure inflationary increases. Um, we've had the opportunity to work with Mr. Young uh, Mr. Scott Martin and uh, their teams on looking at your transportation services and your facility needs and establishing these needs going forward. So a lot of collaboration with the administration on how to project out. So this first chart you see, I want to highlight that in green, the columns represent the annual revenue for the general fund, capital projects fund, and transportation fund for IPS. 
and the orange columns represent the annual expenditures. We pulled data back from 2007, and the reason why we pulled it back from 2007 is because 2007 and 2008 represent years when IPS was supported with a local property tax for their general fund, which you know very well was eliminated in 2009. 2009 is when the state of Indiana assumed full control over the funding formula, and you can see the trend of how that green line for annual revenue decreased from that point. Also want to highlight in 2009 was the first year of the phase-in for property tax cap. Then full phase-in began in 2010. So you had a state challenge and a local challenge that were forcing some of your revenue decline from 2010 and beyond. Subsequently, IPS did enact some expenditure reduction plans and reduced its expenditures from 2011 through 2015, which were necessary in order to to uh, balance the budget. Now you've heard uh, Dr. Faraby and uh, Mr. Ahmed Young talk about some investments in staff that have taken place. And subsequently, you see that the 2016 and 17 years have resulted in, in deficit spending. So I wanna highlight next, this chart represents the annual and projected surplus and deficit for the IPS general fund, capital projects fund, and transportation fund. You see in 2010, there was a jump due to some late collections on property taxes that enabled IPS to build some reserves. Since that time, IPS has been relying on those reserves to, to continue operations and not ask taxpayers for any additional support. That time has come where those reserves are dwindling and you can see the large expected deficit coming through 2026. And ultimately in 2026, there's a rather large funding gap that needs to be addressed in some capacity. This next chart represents the fund balances for again, the IPS general fund, capital projects fund and transportation fund. Due to relying on those reserves back in 2010, IPS has been able to continue operations. However, as you saw from the prior two charts, Trends are beginning to catch up with uh, these investments that have been made for the staff here. And ultimately, we expect a dwindling reserve through 2026. So certainly some challenges when it comes to fund balances for these three funds for IPS. So looking at a proposed operating referendum of 59 cents, these next three charts, we built in some projections on what that could mean for fund balances for those three funds. If we assume no assessed value growth or net assessed value growth for IPS, and we establish a 59 cent tax rate, if we have no net assessed value growth, and based upon our expenditure needs, IPS would end 2026 with approximately $5.1 million in reserves. second model we projected out is if IPS experienced the same growth, the net assessed value from the past eight years and trend that over the next eight years, a 1.7% growth, IPS would end 2026 with $17.3 million in reserves regarding the general fund, capital projects fund, and transportation fund. The last model we projected out with Mr. Western Young and his team is to maintain a 15% reserve, which is very similar to what the state of Indiana relies upon, approximately two months of reserves, what net assessed value growth would be needed over the next eight year, eight, nine years to maintain that 15%. In this model, we assume that if IPS school district maintained a 6.5% annual increase in net assessed value, be able to maintain a 15% reserve. At this point, I want to note that the growth of net assessed value and TIF assessed value was 7.4 or is expected to be 7.4% for the certified amount in 2018. So tremendous growth here in the past year has uh, some benefit with the Central Indiana economic engine. I hope that uh, engine continues to rev here in the coming years, which will have a immediate impact on the IPS bottom line and 
available revenue through a proposed operating referendum tax rate. So in considering what a 59 cent tax rate would be to IPS taxpayers, we have highlighted a model here of 59 cents, which would be above the tax cap. So these are not subject to tax cap impact. So we've highlighted here seven different assumed market value of homes on the top part. And we're going to highlight specifically the median value. So according to the 2015 American Community Survey, the median value was $123,500 for homes within the IPS district. That is a net assessed value once you take out the homestead, supplemental homestead credit, and the mortgage de deduction, a net assessed value of $48,025. So looking at a 59 cent tax rate, the annual impact would be to the median value home, $283.35. On a monthly basis, that would be an impact of $23.61, again, for a 59 cent operating referendum tax rate. Transitioning now to discuss the capital referendum, at this point, I want to say that uh, our team, uh, Dustin and I, have documents available for any patron that would like to see any additional detail regarding this project. But this chart here is a chart that the IPS Finance Committee has seen a number of times. This represents the outstanding debt for the IPS school district. And you can see that uh, 2019 represents the year that is, has max payment. And there are currently eight outstanding debt issuances and will be paid off by 2032. So looking at the specific project budget, working with Mr. Weston Young and Mr. Scott Martin, established a total project budget of $200 million. That would be a total par amount of $200 million. We assume financing costs or what you call cost of issuance for bond attorney work or financial advisement or underwriters fees, printing costs, a lot of miscellaneous costs represented in that budget. The total financing cost would be 2,615,000. And this is certainly an illustrative model and we would work with your team to minimize that as much as possible in, in developing a final plan. Assuming in this illustrative model, the approximately $2.6 million cost of issuance that would leave a project budget of one, or excuse me, $197,385,000. And that would be for hard and soft costs for these projects. So the summary of this illustrative model, I want to, again, highlight that it is a illustrative model at this point. These are not final numbers. But the illustrative example shows par amount of $200 million, which we be repaid over 19 years and one month. Total assumed interest cost would be $128,673,835. Assumed interest rates, $2.6 to $5.9 million. And the max estimated lease rental cost in one given year would be $19,040,000. The impact on the tax rate would be 0.1384. So approximately a 13 cent tax rate impact to taxpayers. I know this chart is very small to see. So this represents the detail that uh, the community and the board saw on the prior slide of what a repayment schedule, illustrative repayment schedule could look like for these set of bonds. This chart represents in the blue the same information you saw in the beginning as far as outstanding indebtedness. The green represents the proposed or illustrative repayment schedule. And you can see in 2021 would be now the peak year for debt repayment of approximately $68 million for the annual budget. Now highlighting what that impact is to taxpayers on a 0.1384 tax rate. I'll go back and mention the median value home of $123,500 for market value, 
net assessed value of $48,025, annual impact estimated at $66.47, monthly impact of $5.54. My final slide for this evening is total combined estimated impact to taxpayers looking at proposed operating and proposed capital referenda. Again, I want to highlight the median value of the home, $123,500, $48,025 on net assessed value, looking at a combined monthly impact of $29.15 estimated for the proposed referenda. At this point, welcome questions. Mr. O'Connor. Brock, on, the, on this chart, I know it, the, what, what I know about the property tax system is every time I think I understand it, I then learn I don't understand it. And I know, so, you know, obviously people have looked at this and calculated, and, and so that, you know, they, they think, one, that's exactly what we're talking about, when in fact it's not what we're talking about. And it can vary, even if we, even if we pursued the maximum, which is, I think, to important to note tonight that we're talking a no more than language for, for the proposal we're considering tonight. But can you explain sort of how the amount somebody pays on, on a, even a percentage or even real amounts can vary from year to year? I presume it's because of net AV growth, but, but it's sort of, it can, it can be, you know, a 30% increase one year and a 10% and a decrease next year. Can you explain that sort of variance for us? Because it's, I, I think sure. everybody... Yeah, great question. Great question. When it comes to property tax bills, it um, it not just factors in the IPS, but also overlapping districts. So we're looking specifically at the IPS projections in regards to the tax rates. So something we can't project out for is what is occurring at uh, for other local units of government. So what may be a percentage impact in regards to this specific rate. There's a lot of things that are occurring a lot of other local units of government that may also increase or decrease their total tax rate paid according to their, their market value and net assessed value. So there's more than just the IPS rate that taxpayers would have to factor in if they wanted to calculate the percentage impact. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing. Remember, if you would like to speak, please sign in on the sheet which is located with Joe Grommelsbacher. As I mentioned earlier, we ask that you limit your comments to the proposed projects and financing. Keep any comments to three minutes and avoid being repetitive if possible. Mr. Grommelsbacher, will you please call the first speaker to the podium? Yes, ma'am. The first commenter for the public hearing that signed up in advance is Antonio Alexander, please. Good evening. It was on March 12, 2009 that Bernie Madoff pleaded guilty to 11 federal felonies and admitted to turning his wealth management business into a massive Ponzi scheme. Mr. Madoff took the money of innocent, non-suspecting members of the community and promised to invest their hard-earned money into certain stocks and bonds. It took several years before people understood that their money was gone and many had lost their entire life savings. Estimated losses to these investors was $18 billion. Now, this money was freely given to Mr. Madoff with the expectation that it would be used for one purpose, but actually it was used for another purpose. Mr. Madoff was in a position of trust, but he destroyed the lives of others. Now, before we let this superintendent who was in a position of trust destroy the lives of our youth, this board, you all, you owe it to the taxpayers, you owe it to the parents, you owe it to our future generation of this community to ask the following questions with intense debate and thoughtfulness. Number one, how did we get to the point that we're at right now? Number two, what happened to the $30 million that this superintendent said that we had in surplus? Number three, why is it that enrollment is down? Why is it that uh, schools are closing? Why is it that teachers are leaving? Number four, if teachers are a priority, 
Why is this superintendent intentionally taking measures that is destroying the, the, the union of these teachers? Number five, if this superintendent truly values education, why has he gotten rid of the best educators? Number six, where is the detailed plan for how these dollars will be spent, not just bullet points in a press release? Number seven, where are the quotes for the repairs and updates for each school? Number eight, will this superintendent guarantee that he will not spend any of these dollars to improve IPS buildings and then turn around and sell those same buildings to charter schools for less than fair market value? Number nine, where are the profit and loss figures for IPS schools that have already been renovated and then sold to charter schools? Number 10, this, this board just approved the closing of four high schools. Why do a referendum before you have the results of the closing of those four schools? And number 11, the state of Indiana has already pulled funding from IPS the last two years. Why would it now give us more money? It said that Bernie Madoff, that he had a personality that was quiet, that was pleasant, that was charming, and he can make any bad deal sound good. Board of Commissioners, we've already had one Bernie Madoff. Let's not have another one. This board, this superintendent has already proven to be irresponsible. Board, move slowly, ask the right questions, get the right answers. Thank you. The next public comment this evening on the public hearing is from Jim Sherrick, please. My name is Jim Sherrick. I'm a professor at the IUPUI School of Education. I'm also president of the IPS Community Coalition that fought against the closing of the high schools. The IPS Community Coalition is not taking a position for or against the referenda. However, we are taking a stand. What we are taking a stand on is that there is a lack of transparency in the IPS financial report and that it's not possible to support a referenda until a transparent budget document is provided to the community. This lack of financial transparency is not just my conclusion and not just the conclusion of the coalition. The Council of the Great City Schools, a highly respected national organization of urban districts, has done an in-depth examination of the IPS budget document and reported that the IPS budget is not in compliance with good transparency practices. The coalition calls on the mainstream media to investigate these issues themselves. Don't just report what the district says or even what we say. Go investigate so you can serve the community. For example, when the financial data report from the Cincinnati Public Schools a demographically similar district was compared to the IPS report, Cincinnati's report was far superior and much more transparent. We have other specific transparency issues we are concerned about in the budget document. Here are some examples. The budget document often uses unexplained codes. This is not transparency. Title I grant deficits were running around 700,000 at the beginning of 2016 school year. But by the end, these deficits suddenly ballooned to almost 3 million without any explanation in the budget document. This is not transparency. Total expenditure exceptions, whatever that means, the budget document doesn't tell us, have in the past been balanced at around 1 to 2 million each year. However, in 2016-17, this item jumped to almost 24 million with an almost 4 million deficit without any explanation. This is not transparency. As this Council of Great City Schools pointed out, the IPS financial document is still not adequately transparent. 
Surely if Cincinnati Public Schools can do a better job, so can we. The community needs a transparent financial document in the form of a comprehensive annual financial report before we can make a good decision about the referenda. Thank you. The next public comment is Andrew Gatza, please. Good evening. I'm an IPS community member and voter, a former teacher within IPS, uh, and a member of the IPS Community Coalition. Tonight I have questions on the referenda to help determine how I will vote in May, uh, and how I will uh, advise others to vote as well, should the board approve the proposal tonight. Uh, first, why does no comprehensive annual report exist that clearly outlines specific operational practices and future projections of IPS, as is done in other districts? How can taxpayers be insured the proposed referenda is the right amount and will actually help the district grow. Clearly the district is in financial trouble, partly due to decrease in uh, funds received. It's not clear, however, that this administration has been spending uh, the funds that they do receive in the most fiscally responsible and most impactful ways to students. Second, why is there no IPS district administration organizational chart available that includes various departments, positions within each department, and the name of the person who holds each position? The district is turning over schools to private management companies in the name of innovation and has outsourced different services previously managed by the district, yet it seems the central office continues to grow in both number and salary size. Uh, including this organizational chart in the aforementioned suggested annual report, as done in other districts, would truly be a step toward transparency. Third, how specifically will monies be distributed across schools and how does this uh, distribution look in regard to neighborhood schools, innovation and magnet schools, and IPS facilities that house charter schools. As noted Tuesday, there are 65 IPS-owned school buildings, 35 of which require at least a million dollars in updates. So where will the money go? Uh, Chalkbeat recently reported that despite efforts for more equity and funding distribution per school, IPS continues to fund programs rather than students, continuing funding disparities. How can the district ensure taxpayers that monies received from the referenda will not continue these disparities? Fourth. Does the district plan to lease or sell Forest Manor at market value to help alleviate financial concerns, uh, or will it be leased or sold for a dollar at, uh, to interested charter schools? Uh, for example, Kip Indy High uh, received, a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, received a letter of support from the IPS administration uh, and has Forest Manor listed as a potential school site in their charter application. More detail is needed about the declaring Forest Manor as surplus. Uh, fifth and finally, what evidence is the district using to support the proposed 2% teacher salary raises uh, and how this will attract and retain quality teachers in IPS, which admit it already pays less uh, than surrounding districts? That proposed 2% annual raise only mirrors average annual inflation, meaning teachers wouldn't actually be getting a raise in real dollars. They simply wouldn't be making less each year. Uh, so how does this attract teachers? Uh, clarification on these issues will be helpful in considering the nearly $1 billion proposed referenda. Thank you very much. The next commenter on this topic is Christine Rembert, please. Good evening, Commissioners and Dr. Farabee. My name is Christine Rembert, and I'm the very proud principal at Francis W. Parker Montessori School 56. I'm speaking tonight in favor of the operating and capital referenda. If you're following Francis Parker um, on Twitter, and I hope you are, then you know we had an amazing learning day at our school. Our early childhood students went to the Connor Prairie Gingerbread Jamboree. They have been studying over the last weeks, reading books about gingerbread men, making gingerbread houses, and baking and, gen uh, baking and decorating gingerbread people. During today's field learning experience to Connor Prairie, they got to find the gingerbread man who had been lost. Great teachers create great learning experiences for young people. Units that engage the head, heart, and hands of young people are what make knowledge stick. Students learned vocabulary and thought about their story. They ciphered when they were baking, so they used their heads. They care about the gingerbread man and care about him being lost, and that engaged their heart, and all that baking and building was hands-on learning. This doesn't happen without being able to recruit and retain excellent staff. Our students in our lower elementary autism class showed me their science experiments today. They grew beautiful crystals in mason jars. 
Increased funding from the referenda will help maintain and grow our programs for students with special needs. They did their science experiment in their classroom rather than our science lab because frequently that lab has HVAC issues. It's either too hot or too cold in the lab, making it a challenging room for students with sensory issues. Our upper elementary students in grades four, five, and six made gingerbread houses to spec today. Um, check out that spec sheet on Twitter. This project had students using math to figure out how many windows they needed, and they figured very strange, irregular surface area challenges. The students then wrote stories about who lived in those houses. Older kids need engaging projects too, and these uh, students have a strong foundation in Montessori. We need better doors and better lights at our school, just like the structures that those kids built today out of graham crackers and icing. Finally, let's address my attire. I don't usually look like this when I go to work, but today was Camp Read Some More, and I participated right along with our kiddos. Some of our students, many of them, spent the better part of the day reading in comfy pajamas, and I got to participate with them. Some of our students don't like to read, and experiences like today provide pleasurable times when students can read together. But a bottleneck happened when it was time to wash our hands before we ate s'mores and drank our cocoa. You see, on our main floor of our building, we have six sinks for boys in a bathroom that has nine stalls and six urinals, while the girls have five sinks and 13 stalls. Our bathrooms on the main floor are woefully inadequate for our growing student population. Last year, we ended the year with 310 students, and today we have 333. I support the proposed operating and capital referenda. Thank you. The next commenter, please, is Lamika Perkins Knight. Good evening, Dr. Farabee and school board members. In this district, I wear many hats, but today I'm coming to speak to you in the most important role ever, as a parent. When I first came to Indianapolis 12 years ago, I charged my husband with finding our family a home in a great school corporation with a short commute. With this said, we purchased our house in a neighboring district. The longer I worked for IPS, the more I realized that school corporations are more than a score or a letter grade. I realized that IPS is the only school district that offers a variety of specialized educational opportunities. To be exact, we offer about 30 different program options for students in K through 12. When it came time for my children to go to school, I chose to cross the boundaries and bring them to IPS. However, when my son was diagnosed with autism, I chose to leave him in the corporation that I thought had the most resources, which was our neighborhood district. I quickly found out that all the glitter is not gold. I found out that only IPS offers a world-class educational experience for students with special needs. When it was time for me to find a new home, I, I chose to purchase a home within the IPS district. It was a no-brainer the second time around because I believe in IPS and I'm willing to pay for what I believe in. I support the referendum because I believe all children should have a world-class system of support and services that empower all students to achieve academic and personal excellence. I support the referendum because all students should have an opportunity to have access to great educators. I support the referendum because it allows a stop to the mass exodus of teachers. I support the referendum because I believe IPS can be a home for early career opportunities instead of a stepping stone, which they lead to advance their career. I support the referendum because it allows veteran teachers to be able to continue to teach in the place that they love and earn their fair wages. I support the referendum because it allows our most vulnerable children to have access to better facilities, accessible playgrounds, equipment, and materials. I support the referendum because it allows IPS to continue to innovate programs for our most vulnerable populations, such as newcomers. I support the referendum because it promotes a district-wide inclusive model for students in both academic and social opportunities. 
I support the referendum because I love ICS and all that it has to offer the inner city students. I urge you to support the referendum because teachers in this district have stayed loyal and ICS is worth fighting for. I have one ask of the board if the referendum passed. Please be transparent on how IPS will use the funds to support students. Thank you. Next public comment this evening is John Thompson, please. Good evening. I'm here to in support of both referenda and uh, I encourage the board to, to vote in favor of the referenda. And, you know, I'll speak to you from several perspectives. But first one, as a business owner, I own several companies, several of which are in the IPS district. And I hire workers all the time. And many of those workers are uh, IPS graduates. And, uh, and I'm looking for educated workers, both college prepared workers and uh, trade prepared workers. One of my companies uh, fabricate millwork, all types of wood, solid surface and all of that. Tech high schools, a perfect high school for producing the kind of graduates that we need there. My engineering firm's looking for engineers, so uh, 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 IPS graduates with, with an interest in science and math is certainly one that that they're looking for once they go on and graduate from, from college. So I'm looking for the full spectrum. And I can speak from other perspectives other than being a business owner. I serve on the board of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. I'm past board chair of the Indy Chamber. I serve on the board and the executive committee of the Indiana Chamber. I'm incoming chairman of the Eskenazi Health Foundation. I'm on the board and the treasurer for Riley Children's Foundation. I can tell you from all of those experiences, the IEDC and my various chambers, we're always attracting businesses to the state, to the city, to center township, to the IPS district. And you know, in days past, they were looking for low taxes, low cost of living, low cost of doing business, favorable regulation. Today, the, the, the fight is for talent. They're looking for educated, skilled workers. And we have to produce that. And the way we do it is by investing in our young people. There's no better investment than investing in young people. I'm a major property owner in Center Township in the IPS district. This will cost me and my company thousands of dollars. I think it's worth it. I think it's well worth it. And so I support uh, the referenda. I'm past board chair of Indiana Black Expo, Indianapolis Museum of Art, and past board chair of Junior Achievement. I invest in young people time, talent, and treasure. Please pass a uh, vote for the referendum. Thank you. Next comment is Mark Orval, please. Good evening. I support the referendum, but I wanted to give you a bit of background on my logic and thought before I get into some of the detail. I'm a native. Indianapolis person. I'm a Hoosier. I have two degrees and a senior degree and advanced degree from Ball State University. I served 29 years working for Eli Lilly and Company as an IT executive. And I'm currently the vice president and center head for a billion dollar company by the name of Artusa, which engineers IT professionals and engineer uh, capability. You know, when I was working for Lilly, we uh, often wanted to recruit locally but had to live with the fact that talent was not available and I had to hire out of state. In my current role, I spend all my time with very senior executives, both in IT and business, and we talk about a conundrum. And the conundrum goes like this. You know we're ranked top five tech city in the country, probably going to top four. 
over the last three years. Yet we look for talent, it's not here, or we're worried it's not going to be here. And as we think about that, things are starting to improve But someone who runs the Midwest, as I do, for Vertusa, a billion-dollar company, who wants to expand, we're trying to look for ways to actually find that talent, and we're worried that Indiana is going to be left behind. Now, if you do your research in the software industry, you will find that there's a tipping point, and it's not very far ahead. In 2025, there will be more software engineers outside the United States than inside. And that fact should really concern us. We need skilled people with strong STEM foundations. Tech innovation needs thousands of people trained with specialized skills, and the foundational educational system must support development of both student curiosity in tech, but problem-solving skills along with STEM curriculum. Business and IT companies need a pipeline of great students with the mindset of a lifelong learning. STEM skills, critical thinking are extremely important. Companies like Vertusa, we want to help. In fact, I talked to a lot of other companies. We all want to help. We're willing to help introduce students to fascinating capabilities being developed in technology that, not unlike skilled trades in previous generations, require skills that are in demand and deliver good paying jobs. Peter Thiel is not entirely wrong in thinking that apprenticeships in the tech works. His German heritage, where apprenticeships and vocational training remain popular and common, contribute to this but the evidence is in Germany's reputation for precision engineering and quality. Virtus is a digital company, and we need future digital engineers. So with all the aspirations for high-quality IPS education, yet there's not a future capital investment stream to reinforce that vision, we need to get to that. So I support the investment with long-term view, ensuring that we have strong education fundamentals that prepare students for modern jobs driving technology innovation. Thank you. Next speaker this evening is Andrea Brown, please. Good evening. My name is Andrea Brown, and I am an active member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated which is an organization of college-educated women con committed to constructive development of its members and to public service with the primary focus on the black community. Vernita Moore, a member of the school board, is a member of this sorority as well and understands the importance of the work that we do in the community. Our sorority is an organization of 200,000 women. Indianapolis Alumni Chapter is comprised of approximately 300 active members. A program under our educational thrust, has been, which has benefited heavily from our partnerships with IPS, is the Delta Gems. Delta Gems is growing and empowering myself successfully, was created to catch the dreams of African-American at-risk adolescent girls aged 14 to 18. Delta Gems provides the framework to actualize those dreams through the performance of specific tasks that develop a can-do attitude. The goals for Delta Gems are to instill the need to excel academically, to provide tools that enable girls to sharpen and enhance their skills to achieve high levels of academic success, to assist girls in proper goal setting and planning for the future in high school and beyond, and to create compassionate, caring, and community-minded young women by actively involving them in service, learning, and community service opportunities. The gyms offer a roadmap for college and career planning through activities that provide opportunities for self-reflection and individual growth. We have been able to hold workshops with these young ladies at Global Prep Academy School 44, Elder Diggs School 42, and Northwest High School. For the last nine years, we have been fortunate enough to be able to use IPS schools for these underserved populations. These schools have a bigger reach to the community other than being in session Monday through Friday. They provide a safe and well-maintained environment for these young women when school is not in session. There is a need to have these successful partnerships with IPS and the need to support this referendum. Thank you. Christopher Wood, please.
Honorable Commissioners, stakeholders, Dr. Faraby, thank you for allowing me this brief moment to speak on behalf of the self-contained autism classrooms in the Indianapolis Public Schools. My name is Christopher Wood, and I'm a third-year teacher at Rosa McClellan Montessori, school number 391. Each day, I serve several students severely impacted by autism spectrum disorder. They have unique needs, academic, social, physical, sensory, and behavioral. A child's day in my classroom is very structured with visual schedules, differentiated lesson plans, sensory diets, and trained staff with visual prompting. Parents view the supports we provide as critical for their children. For instance, current research indicates that there is a great need to continue evidence-based research and methods for resources to help reach our children with various developmental disabilities. As a teacher who works with children with autism and continually seeing their wide span of their needs, I would ask the board consider allowing the passing of a referendum option, not only for my students, but for all the children with vast and various exceptionalities within our district. Having this chance to put the referendum to voters and our stakeholders would allow those families who may currently be aided by special education services to consider the values and norms we all would agree that makes IPS stand out for every student. My fellow colleagues and administrators have great goals in researching more student-centered resources. We have just adopted curriculum through the unique learning system, which aids teachers in presenting grade level standards to each child, but teach it at their individual differentiated level. My school and district leaders are researching a continuation of supports for seventh through 12th grades. With these hopeful endeavors regarding more supports to be suddenly cut short because of a budget crisis, I fear this would be devastating all around to the children whose needs are being served, especially those within the self-contained classrooms. I also know that teacher retention is a great concern within our district. I am dedicated to serving my young scholars and their families, yet it is becoming increasingly difficult to spend money of our own on resources in the academic supplements and even some technologies. The referendum would greatly benefit all learners with an IPS. I ask that all stakeholders also consider our population with such prevalent, pre, prevalent exceptionalities. Each individual has great purpose, and I believe Indianapolis Public Schools can continue to guide every individual towards this goal. Thank you. Madam President, our next public commenter isn't present, but delivered her remarks to somebody else. Would you permit that person to read those remarks? Um, yes. So if I could have Angie Moore, please, speaking on behalf of Sharon Pierce this evening. Good evening, Commissioners. Dr. Faraby. I'm reading on behalf of Sharon Pierce. My name is Sharon Pierce, and I am privileged to serve as the President and CEO of the Villages of Indiana our state's largest child and family service nonprofit. At the Villages, we champion every child's right to a safe, permanent, and nurturing home through the provision of foster care, adoption, adoption and family services, touching more than 3,000 Indiana children every day. We are committed to strengthening all families and embracing the dignity and diversity of every child, youth, and family served. I know that we share many goals with IPS, and we also share the honor of working with many of the same children. I regret that I cannot be at your meeting this evening, but wanted to share my support as you consider the possibility of pursuing a referendum. The IPS district does such vital work in the core of our city and carries an especially heavy load of providing educational services to children with special needs, including many foster children. I stand beside you as you ask the community to support the good work you do every day and prepare for an even stronger academic future for these worthy children. Thank you for your time and commitment to the students of Indianapolis Public Schools, greatly, gratefully submitted by Sharon Pierce. Next this evening, we have Charity Scott, please. Good evening. I am an alumna and former teacher of IPS and a member of the IPS Community Coalition. At Tuesday's review session, in reference to the proposed referenda, Dr. Fairby claimed financial transparency because of the financial audits completed by the State Board of Accounts, also known as the SBOA. 
At the, uh, the latest IPS audit by the SDOA found a few areas of non-compliance. Here are a few highlights. The failure to establish an effective internal control system resulted in the school corporation's non-compliance with a grant agreement and the compliance requirements. Another one, the semi-annual certifications of the 2015-16 school year were not presented for audit. And the lack of controls and record keeping was a systematic problem during the period audited. As the audit found compliance and internal control issues within the district, this provides a poor example of financial transparency. IPS administration and many board members are likely aware of district transparency issues. After taking office in 2014, Dr. Farabee had the Council of Great City Schools review the business and finance department. They found for district financial reporting and communications, quote, the district's financial reporting lacks transparency at virtually every level. Of course, the district has made some changes in response to this report, but their first recommendation was to, quote, produce a comprehensive annual financial report, or CAFR, that com complies with the uh, accounting requirements promulgated by the Government Accounting Standards Board. If IPS had done this three and a half years ago, I'm quite certain constituents would overwhelmingly vote yes to these referenda. Similarly sized, Cincinnati Public Schools produces a uh, comprehensive financial report, first as a CAFR, but now as a comprehensive five-year forecast document. It's a 29-page document which has accompanying explanations for changes in revenue and expenditures, definitions and descriptions of funds, financial policies, and graphs with paragraphs of, sorry, with paragraphs of descriptions concerning changes in forecasted revenue and expenditures. IPS budget reports have none of these characteristics. Currently, Cincinnati Public Schools is hoping that the emergency tax levies, which were established during the recession and are due to expire, will be reapproved so that major cuts do not have to occur. Their amazing transparency over the years will improve the likelihood of voters choosing to keep the tax levies. As tax levy increases for the referenda are being proposed by IPS, the IPS Community Coalition reiterate one of the great, the, one of the Council of Great City Schools three and a half year old recommendations that IPS move to a CAFR document to report their annual finances. Thank you. Next, we have King Row Conley, please. Good evening. I am King Row Conley, and I am past city councilor at large and majority leader of the city council. Currently, I am the political liaison for the Baptist Ministers Alliance and the Interdenominational Ministers Alliance, which consists of 1,100 churches in the 7th Congressional District. I'm also past program director of WTLC Radio. Not only a strong voice in the African American communi uh, community, but in the community at large and also in the IPS district. I'm here tonight because I believe that the success of Indianapolis public schools is Indy success. Although I didn't grow up in Indianapolis, I grew up in a public school system in Augusta, Georgia. Same rules apply. The board has recently made a tough decision for the betterment of the students, teachers, and family within the district. As a community voice in IPS district, I urge you to support putting the referendum question on the ballot in May 2018. Together, we can invest in the district. It is our civic duty to ensure that students receiving equitable education Teachers are fairly compensated. Got to do that again. Teachers are fairly compensated, and all involved have a safe space to learn. When we win there, we win everywhere. Tonight starts a process if the board approves, when the board <laughs> approves the recommendations to the uh, referendum. The community must step up and advocate for every black white, Hispanic, Asian, poor, rich, and special needs students in the district. These students are the future of our city. Let's make this the best urban school district in the country so that can make Indianapolis the best city in the country. As I stated, I didn't grow up in, here in Indianapolis, 
but I am a full-fledged huger. I've been here 34 years, and I came in get it, giving. I would like to compliment Dr. Fairber and his staff on a job well done. The wheels of progress must turn. Thank you very much. The next comment is from Alex Butler, please. Good evening. My name is Alexander Butler. I'm the guardian of a 17-year-old high school student at Arsenal Tech and the father of a 20-month-old who will eventually be an ITS student. Um, as I've been following this in the news, I have become concerned of what we are getting ready to do with the money that we have already collected and what we will do with the money that uh, we will get from the tax referenda. Before I came tonight, I did not know about these other groups of seeking transparency, but I had already thought to myself as I read the news articles and searched the IPS uh, website, where are we spending this money? How will we spend this money? Why are we spending this money? With my 17-year-old, it's been interesting to watch multiple principals go through one high school in the last several years. I believe money is very important in helping our schools, but so is consistency and adequacy or adequate leadership. I've said this before, and I don't say it very lightly, but Tech High School has often been run like the Cleveland Browns. If you don't know that reference, they've had multiple coaches, general managers, and quarterbacks. I'm not a Browns fan, but they're a bad organization. And I don't want to be like that organization. And so I think it's very important as we go to this tax referenda that we understand exactly how it's being used. I'm also a homeowner in the district. Um, the money, $566, I believe, would be my approximate tax add-on each year. I have the money to give, but I don't want to give it to something that's going to be inefficiently used, sold to somebody else, and not given directly to our teachers. If the entire $200 million was going for raises for our teachers, I would absolutely vote for this. But to fix buildings that we don't know how they'll be used and when they'll be used or when they will be or not be part of IPS, that's very difficult to vote for, and I am not sure that I will vote for it as long as there's not more transparency on how we will use the money. I'm also concerned with other things with a property tax cap. For instance, I believe our tax cap only takes 10% of the monies we get each year. Other school districts have significantly larger amounts taken from them, and yet they seem to be efficiently educating their students. And so that seems to suggest that there are still some inefficiencies, even though we've closed some high schools, which I was sad about because I believe in the local school. But at the same time, if we're not running to capacity, are we really using our money as efficiently? And so I would like the board and the commissioners to consider uh, becoming more transparent before we send this bill to the voters. And uh, we all want better schools, like the parents and principals have said, but we need more transparency. Madam President, that concludes the sign-ups I've received thus far this evening. Okay. If there's anyone else present who would like to speak to this issue, you may do so. Uh, we just ask that you would state your name and address on the sign-in sheet. Okay. Thank you. We will now close the public hearing and consider the resolutions. Thank you to all who participated in the hearings. We appreciate your time and interest in the projects and the future of our community. Please note that this is just the first step in the legal process. The board will continue to work with the administration and district staff to look for efficiencies to conserve tax dollars while meeting our educational needs. Um, at this time, I think I'm going to go ahead and ask if we would like to have commissioners make comments concerning the resolutions we're considering this evening. Commissioner Gore. Good evening, and thank you, President Sullivan. As a board member, I continue to reflect on the statement, our children's lives matter. I was talking to one of our IPS student advocates this morning as they were on their way to pick up a student 
whose family is in disarray. This child had no one to wake her and her siblings up, not even an alarm clock. So they were running late, missed the bus, but really wanted to go to school. The father is disinterested, the mother is incarcerated, incarcerated. siblings are shot and are in jail. This represents a percentage of our students. Then last night I had an opportunity to talk to my four-year-old grandson who had looked at the news. He was talking about the wildfire in California. Um, he even told me about the Pacer game, who was winning. And he lives in Tennessee. I also have a great-grandson who builds intricate tracks for his cars to run on looking at a patterns. This also represents a percentage of our students with parental direction. Each example is of a child who can learn but have different circumstances. They want to learn and can learn. Some of them are hindered and others are promoted education for them by their home. How can we help. I suggest that we look at the referenda. It will help to provide safe, quality public schools, which will help attract new businesses, jobs, residents, while strengthening our community. Investing in IPS is an investment in Indianapolis' future. IPS needs this new funding to hire and retain superb teachers, make classrooms safer, and provide high quality education programs. Nearly every school district in Marion County and surrounding counties has passed a school referendum to increase funding, and IPS hasn't sought a tax increase in 10 years. IPS needs more funding to complete with, compete with surrounding school districts. As I heard and I agree, we do not take this lightly. We understand in households with tight budgets that our request to pass these referenda has special meaning. IPS as you've heard stated, has lost 16.8 million annually since 2011 due to tax gap. I would suggest that the operating referendum, if passed, it will allow, allow the district to provide for all employees with 2%, with a 2% cost of living salary increase annually, maintain health care benefits as cost neutral for employees, and continue to provide excellent services for our students with special needs. The capital referendum would generate the $200 million to fund the Safe and Equitable School Project, which calls for renovating and improving school facilities making safety enhancement and upgrading classroom technology and equipment. If we don't pass the referendum and it's not funded, IPS would be forced to freeze teacher and employee compensation, reduce educational programs for students, reduce the quality of some services for students, with special needs, continue to defer building maintenance, and reduce transportation services. It's, it related to high school closures? At this point, no. The all-choice high school experience is an innovative approach to education, enabling students to offer, IPS to offer students high-quality education to every student and right-size the district's 
operational footprint. I agree with everyone. We need to be transparent. When you find the board is not transparent, talk to us, come to us, and let us know. We are the people who are responsible to you. Each school, however, needs a compassionate and challenging teacher. As I started out, I want you to understand that it's really important for us to un make sure that we take charge of each child in the district and to make sure that their lives matter, to make sure that they get a quality education that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner O'Connor. First, Madam Chair, could I ask King Roe Conley to read my comments? I, I was uh, going to ask him if he would read mine. <laughs> you could just come to the microphone and um, do the rest of this meeting. Sorry, pardon me for that. Um, th there must be something about entering my mid-50s, and Superintendent Fairby, you'll be here someday. So, um, Because there have been several instances in the past year where I've had to explain to colleagues, neighbors, and friends the historical pr perspective of many issues. Um, and it's kind of led me to believe that perhaps I've been around too long. <clears throat> Tonight is no different. Any conversation regarding property taxes in Indiana, and particularly Indianapolis, requires much of the same historical perspective. The way in which we fund local units of government, and that includes school systems, changed dramatically in 2007 and 2008. Now, frankly, I'm a bit conflicted about it, depending upon which point of view I take. As a property taxpayer, I'm pleased that my property taxes are lower in real dollars than they were 10 years ago. As an elected school board member, I struggle because it hasn't meant simply slowing the growth of spending on education. It has meant significantly fewer dollars coming to IPS from that avenue of funding. I won't go into details because it would take way too long, but as part of Indiana's property tax cap system, the state took over funding of certain aspects of our budgets However, those dollars as reflected in our per people funding continue to decrease. In recognition of that reality, the legislature created the mechanism we are discussing today to gain local community support for increased funding for our schools. The old school funding referenda were considered extraordinary. The current system is part of the design process for funding school systems. We know that more than two thirds of the school systems in Marion County have availed themselves to this process for increased funding we also know that school systems in surrounding counties are on their second round of, re of operating fund referendum. We know that because of a detailed story in our local paper outlining the funding challenges all school systems are facing, and they describe this as the new normal. We also know that until now, IPS has not pursued a funding referendum. IPS has worked diligently to make our own finances more transparent, and I'm proud of the works we have done in that effort as the chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, but I also want to recognize Dr. Farabee, Weston Young, and the staff here at IPS that had gone far along that path before I joined the board. And I want to invite the folks who would like to understand our transparency better to come and attend our meetings. They're publicly noticed, and they're open to the public. Please join us. Uh, I'm also proud that we've sold unused properties, not just generating one-time revenue, but also reducing the significant recurring cost of operations and maintenance of those unused or underutilized properties. That process will continue. I'm pleased of the work that Dr. Farabee has done in streamlining administrative costs of our school system to the point that in this year's budget, administration costs are 4.4% of our total budget. And I commit that we'll continue to make progress there also. Is there work that remains? Yes. But I can confidently say that we have cleaned our own house, pursued efficiencies, made changes to create a school system that uses money wisely, wisely and still does our job well. We are at this point today because that's what the current system of funding requires of us. I take our responsibility, and all of us take our responsibility, an obligation to educate our children in a world-class world system very seriously. We must focus on teacher pay to help keep the best and the brightest teachers. And to be honest with you, I don't just want to be competitive in recruiting and retaining the best talent. I want to be the competition. We all know that we have dispro disproportionately high percentage of special education students in our district, and we know that the state and the federal funding for special education students is lower than our actual cost. We're all also committed to making sure our students get the best education 
and we will never cut corners in providing what every student has a right to. We also know that our buildings are aging and need repair, but we believe and demand that our students are safe and secure when in our care, and our commitment to that will not lessen due to financial challenges. We can't and won't allow students in the IPS system to be second-class students in any way. As chair of the IPS Finance Committee, in each of our quarterly meetings, we have detailed savings from bond refinancing, savings from property sales, savings from streamlining and efficiencies at the school and administration level. We've also recognized through our financial forecasting uh, that we would need to pursue a funding referendum in the near future. I do not engage in this discussion lightly, nor, nor do I discuss adding financial burden to our property taxpayers glibly. We would not ask for increased funding if it were not necessary. Just like a competitive tax structure is important to a competitive city, so is a high quality school system that provides a world class education to our children and a proud career that rewards our teachers with the value of changing lives for the better and a salary that allows them to raise and educate their own children just like educators everywhere. Much like each of us are required to create a budget and live within that budget in our home lives, we are charged with creating a budget and living within that budget in our school system. This is the first step in the process and in May the voters, all the voters, within the IPS district will get, get their chance to support or not support this effort. We also have the responsibility as a board and administration to work with our, in our community at each point in this process to make sure we are funding the key needs of our system. I pledge to work throughout the entire process to make sure we're asking only for what is necessary to run a world class system and to make sure that as part of the larger governmental ecosystem that we operate in, that our financial ask of the taxpayers do not create a tax burden that makes Indianapolis an uncompetitive community. I'll be voting in favor of today's proposal. Thank you. Mr. Arnold. I also will be sub supporting uh, the referenda. Uh, I supported it several years ago when this district sought funds to put air conditioning in our schools, that our children were sitting in buildings um, in August with temperatures nearing 100 degrees. Our children deserve better, and we worked hard to make that happen. Uh, as we move forward, I believe our children deserve to have safe buildings. If you read the paper, you see that not all schools are safe, that there are times that children are in peril. We have to do better for our children. Um, for us to be successful, we have to have good teachers, and we have to compensate them to keep them. Uh, when the report was uh, spoken of from the Council of Great City Schools, um, that was done at the request of this district so that we could do a better job. That wasn't done to us. That was done with us so that we could find out how we could do a better job of spending the resources we have and being transparent. And I believe that we've done a great job of doing that. So moving forward, uh, I applaud the district for the efforts that have been made to reduce our expenses. I wish we weren't here today having to do this if our district would be funded. But also keep in mind, we're not asking for resources to build college-level athletic um, complexes as some other districts have done. We're asking for the basic things for our children. The children of IPS deserve the same type of high quality teachers, safe buildings that children that live in every other district deserve. And so I will very, very gladly support uh, the proposal. Commissioner Hoops. IPS must pursue uh, operating and capital improvement referenda in May 2018 election. Although the administration has been diligent about cutting overhead and operating costs, declining local, state, and federal funding, uh, and investments in teacher and employee compensation and benefits have led IPS to operate at a structural deficit. IPS will not be able to carry out its public education duties without additional tax dollars. The operating referendum would generate $92 million annually for eight years. These dollars are needed to, one, attract and retain teachers. It's impossible to provide a high quality education to every student if we aren't able to attract and retain teachers. IPS teacher com compensation must be competitive. We also need to expand academic programs so that IPS students can achieve their full potential and gradu graduate and be prepared 
for the next stage of their lives, whether that's college, career, or military. And we also need to provide the wide range of support and services for students with special needs. Although there is a projected slight decline in special needs enrollment, the complexity of the support and services needed will continue to increase. The capital referendum would also generate a total of $200 million. These dollars are needed to renovate and improve uh, our school facilities, to enhance safety and security in school facilities, to upgrade classroom technology and equipment. With the passage of the capital referendum, IPS would have the opportunity to significantly improve the educational experience for all students. With declining state and federal funding and increasing costs, IPS must turn to an operating and capital improvement referendum to pursue its additional tax dollars. The bottom line is IPS cannot continue to operate at a structural deficit. High quality, successful public school benefits the community as a whole by attracting and retaining residents and helping attract new businesses and jobs. Indianapolis needs IPS to succeed and IPS needs the support of the Indianapolis community with the support of the referenda. Um, I have uh, some comments prepared from Commissioner Bentley that I'd like to read at this time. As an elected official serving on this board, monitoring the effective use of taxpayer dollars is a significant responsibility. I take that responsibility very seriously. Asking taxpayers, including my family and friends, to pay more isn't an easy thing to do, nor is it something I take lightly. While I cannot be there tonight because I'm recovering from surgery, I fully support the district's request for additional taxpayer dollars. Since 2009, the Indiana General Assembly has dramatically changed the way public schools are funded in Indiana. These changes have resulted in declining revenues for the Indianapolis Public Schools General Fund. At the same time, a change to the Indiana Constitution created property tax caps, which have further eroded the district revenues for capital projects and transportation. In doing so, the legislature decided that decisions on providing adequate support for public schools would rest with local taxpayers. During my years of service on this board, I've consistently lamented the changes in school funding and discussed the detrimental effects these changes could have on Indianapolis public schools. While we cannot control what happens at the state and federal level, we do have the ability to ask the residents of our district to provide financial support for our teachers and students. To inform my decision, I have relied on the following fiscal facts. Since 2011, IPS per pupil funding from the state has declined by 5.3%, while the statewide average per pupil funding has gone up by 3.9%. This translates to approximately 10 million less for IPS each year. Since 2011, IPS has lost an average of $16.8 million annually due to the implementation of property tax caps. Compared to 2011, IPS receives $14.2 million less in federal funding. In total, this amounts to a decrease in operating budget of over $40 million a year. These are the facts about our revenue. To fully understand our financial position, we also have to consider the district's expenditures. IPS expends general fund dollars above and beyond state allocations for special needs learners to provide necessary services to the high proportion of students in the district with special needs. During the 2016-17 school year, IPS spent over $19 million from the general fund to provide special education services. During the same year, IPS spent over $6 million from the general fund to provide services to English language learners. While all districts have to allocate funds beyond what the state provides, IPS educates a much higher proportion of students with special needs than other Indiana districts. IPS has a special education rate of over 17%, while the average Indiana district serves around 14% special education students. Over 14% of IPS students receive services as English language learners, while the Indiana average is under 5%. This is not a responsibility we consider a burden, but instead a strength. The diversity of learners in IPS is a tremendous asset, but we can't pretend that educating students with special needs doesn't come at a cost. To address our, our revenue challenge, IPS has acted aggressively to reduce expenditures on central services and underutilized buildings. Over the last three years, IPS has sold underutilized buildings to earn over $15 million, and since 2011, the district has reduced per pupil expenditures on central administration by over 32%. percent 
While reducing central administration and selling excess properties, IPS has also made long overdue investments in teacher compensation. For years, the district operated under a salary freeze, and any additional compensation for teachers came in the form of small one-time bonuses. Beginning in the 2015-16 school year, IPS created a new salary schedule to provide teachers with raises for the first time in years. We aren't near where we want or need to be, but we're moving in the right direction. This board also made the decision that the district would absorb significant increases in the cost of health care benefits. In the face of declining revenues, we have prioritized reductions in central services and operating costs while investing in our teachers. The district's request for additional taxpayer dollars will allow us to continue these critical investments in our teachers and school leaders and continue providing much needed support to our struggling schools as well as expanding our successful high demand schools. Indianapolis is a wonderful place to live and raise a family. We need high quality schools and the funding to support them. I also have just a few comments. Um, this morning I had the pleasure of evaluating student presentations at one of our truly innovative innovation schools, Thrival Academy. Thrival Academy is housed on the Arsenal Tech campus, is part of what the founders hope will one day be a network of study abroad public high schools providing global education to students regardless of race or socioeconomic status. As I listen to the students tell me about their academic and social emotional growth, their successes, their struggles, and their strategies to overcome them, their hopes and dreams for their futures, it was so clear to me that we really do have the power to change lives, tens of thousands of lives. Every day, our beautiful children are counting on us, which brings us to tonight's vote. We spend a lot of time on this board trying to create the right conditions to bring transformative educational experiences to all of the children and families we serve. And we think we're on the right track. We've laid a good foundation and now it's time to invest in that plan. So where do we need to make our most critical investments? Our core commitments and beliefs state that the student-teacher relationship drives success. Without great teachers, we cannot have great schools. That seems like a really obvious statement, but talented, effective teachers have choices about where they teach, and we must have the ability to compete for and retain the very best teachers for our students. Our core commitments and beliefs also state that students learn best in schools that are safe, clean, nurturing, and respectful environments. Our schools all across this district must be consistently safe and offer similar levels of technology because we believe in the fair and equitable distribution of resources within this district. It's another one of our core commitments. We may not be able to control for equity outside of this district, but we can control how resources are distributed within it. We have worked hard to make sure that we are operating as efficiently as possible before determining our needs for the future. We've made some tough decisions. We've asked our staff to do more for less, and the time has come to ask for what we need to get the job done and do it well. We are keenly aware that we face a complicated and difficult task if every student is to reach their full potential. But here's something else we know. Our kids are smart, creative, resilient, and want to be happy, successful, contributing members of our community. The kids of Indianapolis, the city of Indianapolis, desperately needs the talents of our kids. We are in this together. Please help us support our teachers, ensure our special needs students flourish, and provide buildings where our students are safe to learn and grow. And special thanks to Abby, Mariella, Ali, and Jocelyn at Thrival Academy for reminding me why we do this work in a very poignant and personal way. Um, Mr. Young, at this time, could, would you please summarize the project resolution? Yes, ma'am. The project resolution is required when the school is planning to spend more than $1 million per building. It contains the estimated hard and soft construction costs and the cost of issuance and establishes the total project cost. 
It also contains the estimated tax impacts. Could I have a motion and a second to adopt the project resolution number 7765? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Mr. Young, could you please summarize the preliminary determination res resolution? The preliminary determination resolution is required when a school is planning to finance more than $2 million for a given facility. It contains the total project cost, maximum annual payment and lease term, and other financial terms, such as the estimated principal amount and tax impact. Could I have a motion and second to adopt the preliminary determination resolution number 7766? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. The next resolution is a reimbursement resolution relating to the financing of the construction project. This resolution permits the school corporation to reimburse itself from bond proceeds for any cash which it might spend on the projects prior to the closing on the bonds. It is required by federal tax law in order to preserve the school corporation's ability to reimburse itself. Could I have a motion and second to adopt the reimbursement resolution number 7767? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Mr. Young, could you please summarize the referendum tax levy resolution? According to statutory requirements, the referendum tax levy resolution makes the necessary findings that the school corporation cannot carry out its public educational duty unless it imposes a referendum tax levy. The initial proposed form of the public question and maximum tax levy are also set. But I have a motion and second to adopt the referendum tax levy resolution number 7768. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. This completes the referenda preliminary determination hearing. I will now turn the agenda over to Dr. Farabee for superintendent reports. Thank you, Madam President. There are two superintendent reports for this season. The first one is item 6.01. It's a brief update from the administration on the school quality review process, which includes information on interventions for those schools still needing support, and also identification of strengths and opportunities to grow for those schools that have been identified for the school quality review. It's important to note that this is our first year and cycle of the school quality review process to capture not only quantitative data, but also provide a qualitative analysis of school progress where schools have struggled either with achievement or growth and schools identified for the school quality review process have been in the bottom quartile for uh, proficiency and growth. We also will have a highlight of a school that was identified for the school quality review process that has made tremendous progress over the year. Pleased to highlight again the progress of William McKinley School on 39. We also are fortunate to have the principal with us this evening. Uh, Stacy Coleman, who's led the charge of transformation there. We have Alicia Johnson, our innovation officer, who will lead the presentation. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fairby. Good evening, Commissioner. Let's see. It looks like I'm having the opposite problem from Ahmed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as Dr. Fairby just referenced tonight, I'll be talking with you and providing um, additional update on our school quality review. And so I'll give you, again, a brief summary of the SQR, um, just a review of what I've spoken to you before about in terms of our process, and then update you on those recommended supports for the schools that received SQRs this year. So if you'll recall, um, we established the school quality review really for fourfold reasons. Um, to have a, a common way to talk about the quality and effectiveness of our schools, to foster continued dialogue between the school team and central services team around quality and effectiveness, 
to furnish our school leaders as well as our district leaders with qualitative data to, to contextualize the quantitative testing data that we receive um, and to get that information also from parents, teachers, and community partners. And then to also use this information to support our district decisions around interventions, restarts, um, support strategies, closures, or, ex or expansion. And so the lenses that we used in defining which schools would receive a school quality review were twofold. First, we looked at schools that performed in the bottom 25% in terms of student proficiency on ISTEP, our state assessment. And then we looked at, of those schools, the schools that were in the bottom half in terms of uh, how students grew on that assessment. We used those two lenses then to determine the schools that would receive an SQR. In that school quality review process, it was a comprehensive day-long visit uh, from a cross-functional team of district leaders where we met with school leadership, teachers, staff, community partners, families, and students to just learn more about the school, things that were going well, um, and places where the school could improve. Uh, we started those in August and concluded them at the end of September and then released to the school leadership teams a comprehensive report regarding our findings. Just a reminder of um, the schools that received an SQR this year. And then um, seen this graphic as well before in terms of how we think about our support strategies. Um, and so if we start at the top of the staircase, if you will, and look at what sort of triggers our process, we look at how our schools all how all of our schools performed. Um, from there, we identified schools to receive a school quality review. All schools receive some level of universal support. Um, there are specialized supports provided to um, schools based on their need, based on their requests, based on what our district leaders see as a particular needs the school might have. The next layer of support down would be the schools that are designated as IPS priority schools, and so they receive more intensive school-specific supports. We also have schools that are part of our transformation zone, and so they receive additional coaching supports and resources that are provided by the state. Um, and then in that staircase, you can also see the legend that sort of breaks out the level of flexibility and degree of flexibility that schools and the different support strategies receive. And so we started this process in April uh, and named the schools that would be eligible for an SQR and conducted meetings with their school leadership teams to talk to them about this process, given that it was new for us. Um, June through September, we issued letters, met with community partners um, and school families around what to expect in the coming school year. As I said, we had those visits in August and September, and then starting last month when I came back um, to you with some recommendations, we started to share out those findings with you all, and so I'll conclude that this evening. So to the recommendations. Um, I won't read the entire slide to you, but I'll briefly talk about the celebration area and the area of improvement. Uh, and this is very similar to what the school leadership teams received, uh, the same language around things to celebrate that were going well in the school and then places to improve. Um, so we'll start with Emma Donnan Elementary School. You can see that several things to celebrate, um, including the focusing that they had on their planning and feedback cycle, clearly communicated school-wide expectations, um, very much had a very strong data-driven approach to how they've developed their instructional priorities, uh, the conducting of their professional learning community, so that's the teacher professional development that happens within the school day with their teacher team. Um, and then we heard a lot of positive feedback from stakeholders around the school leadership team. Places that we highlighted for improvement um, included addressing rigor, so there was just variance in the levels of, of rigor um, which is sort of like the, the level of questioning that students receive, sort of how are we pushing students to think at a higher level. So when we talk about rigor, that's really what we're talking about. How are we challenging and pushing our students? Um, and then there was variance in their school-wide reward system. And then you can also see the quick wins. Quick wins were things that we provided to the team the day of our visit to just say, here are some things that we think you could probably address pretty immediately uh, and get bang for your buck in terms of continuing to move the school forward. So in terms of our recommended supports for Emma Donnan, that's one of our innovation schools. And so we'll continue our regular support and visits from the innovation team. Greg Newland provides that support from my team. Um, and then also, as they request, provide the additional um, district resources. So there, our innovation schools can um, purchase service through our curriculum instruction team, 
um, attend principal meetings. So those things are still available to them as they choose to take advantage of them. I'll move to George Buck School 94 next. And so again, you can see several things uh, that we highlighted to celebrate there, including a positive classroom environment, um, a new school leader, so she's in her first year at the school, felt really strong about the ways in which she was prioritizing giving feedback to her teachers and really using her data to drive the decisions that were happening in her school. Um, and families really talked about the ways in which they are being engaged uh, more often and in a more authentic way. In terms of areas of improvement, you'll see again um, rigor, saw variance in the way the level of student engagement in classrooms, um, and then the ability for the school to really communicate what their goals are academically to families. So that was an area we didn't hear come through as much when we talked with families. In terms of recommended support, George Buck is currently an IPS designated priority school, and so they are prioritized in terms of the time that the academic improvement officer spends supporting that school. Um, that school leadership routine meets with the AIO biweekly. Um, the assistant principal is also receiving some direct coaching through the learning community coach. We also um, will be providing expanded professional development opportunities, particularly as it relates to special education and ESL. The school is also slated to participate in Project Lead the Way, and so that should bring some additional funding to the school um, around STEM programming for, for their students. Next is Harshman Middle School. And so there we um, celebrated the culture that was really clear and strong throughout the building, as well as the engaged stakeholders. Um, had a lot of participation in those stakeholder meetings at Harshman. Um, rigor shows up again as an area where there's a need to focus. Um, and we also pushed the, the staff to think about the ways in which they've been really clear about the Harshman way as it relates to culture and climate, getting um, more clear about how they think about the Harshman way in terms of their academic um, vision and, and um, focus. And so that will be what um, Greg, as the AIO supporting Harshman, will be focusing on with that school leadership team. So to that end, um, one of our suggested and recommended supports is to um, have those weekly meetings with the academic improvement officer. So those things include direct coaching, observing the teacher PLCs that are happening, um, additional support from the curriculum and instruction team, as well as biweekly coaching with math and ELA. Um, and then having our REA, our research evaluation and assessment team, support um, as it relates to data analysis so that we can really help them come up with that explicit academic vision. They also are part of our autonomy cohort, and so Education Resource Strategies, ERS, um, is continuing to do follow-up visits, again, to support them in, in determining and figuring out how they want to implement and really clearly define that academic vision. Next is James Wickham Riley School 43. Um, and so the areas to celebrate there, again, there's a school leader um, who's in his second year at the school. Lots of positive feedback around his leadership. Um, really engaged stakeholders at the school and strong evidence of teacher planning and administrative feedback. So um, saw that quite a bit throughout the day. Areas of improvement were about around classroom management, student engagement, and again, rigor. So you might be sensing a theme here when it comes to the ways in which we're really pushing our student thinking in classroom. In terms of recommended supports, again, James Wickham Riley was already designated an IPS priority school, which means that that leadership team, again, gets additional coaching support um, through the check-ins with the academic improvement officer and the learning community coach. Um, and then expanding professional development, again, specifically with special education. Um, and they've also working with Scholastic, so an external organization who's coming in and doing some teacher development with them. And that was something that the school opted into as well. Um, the principal at James Wickham Riley is also participating in the Relay School of Education Principal Development Training. So he was um, in Colorado present, uh, participating in that training last summer and, will be, and has been going back to sessions throughout the course of this year. Um, and then we'll be able to send someone from his team to go back this next summer, again, to continue to build the instructional leadership capacity at the school. And that's been very positively received. At Lewis B. Russell, um, again, a new school leader at Lewis B. Russell this year. And so we saw um, a lot of priority around building relationships with staff and families. We were there, I think he was maybe in week three when we came in to do the SQR, so really new in his tenure at the school. Uh, but folks were able to talk about the shift that they were already experiencing. Um, 
and also saw evidence of clear classroom expectations, places to continue to push again around rigor, um, and in the communication of academic expectations to families. In terms of the supports, um, Lewis B. Russell is currently identified as an IPS transformation zone school. Um, oh, and they are not innovation schools, so that should not be there. But they continue to receive support from our TZ coaches as transformation zone coaches, as well as the director of transformation through um, weekly meetings with that school leadership team. So that coaching sessions, data analysis, observing PLCs, um, basically being to, in service of the principal and what he's identifying as needs to, for support. Uh, and then finally, William McKinley. Um, this is a school where we saw lots of great things happening. I'm really happy Principal Coleman will be here to talk about that. Um, we saw clear procedures across the school again. Um, a respected school leader who clearly had a very strong vision, a laser-like focus on executing against that vision. Um, very clear instructional priorities that teachers were able to speak to, students were able to speak to, um, and teachers and staff talking about how valued and respected they felt as members of that school community. In terms of areas of improvement, they continue to work on rigor. Um, and one of our questions was, how does, how does Principal Coleman continue to sustain her progress? So you'll hear her talk about what she's done, and we want to figure out as a leadership team, how can we be most of service to her in being able to sustain the progress that she's made? And so what we'll do is what we've been doing. She's obviously found what is working for her, and so we'll continue to support her through monthly meetings with her improvement officer, coaching as needed, data analysis support as needed, um, and observations as she requests and as she needs. So I'll ask her to come up, really excited about the progress that she was able to make um, at William McKinley this year, and excited to have her share that with you all directly. All right, I just want to say good evening. Um, I am Ms. Coleman, I'm the principal at William McKinley. Uh, this is currently my second year at William McKinley, and the SQR process was great. It was great feedback from the leadership team, district committee coming in and seeing what, what we were doing and the things that we needed to, to, to fix to move forward. Um, in the 2016-2017, we had a very, like she said, very laser-like focus, and we had three things that we were really looking at. Um, those three things were the weekly uh, teacher-led PLC meetings, there was school-based professional development, and there was a focus on school-wide climate and culture. Those three um, strategies that we really looked at for the school year uh, netted us a 13% increase overall on ISTEP scores. So for ELA, we had a 9.5 increase, and for math, we had a 16.4 increase. With that being said, uh, we had an average of 125 growth points, um, which is why we are a grade, uh, a DOE grade of a B. Um, in addition to that, we decreased um, out-of-school suspensions by 38%, and classroom referrals were decreased by 55%. So these three very specific strategies are what allowed us to get there. So the first one that we'll talk about really quickly is the teacher-led professional um, sorry, the um, uh, PLC meetings. So for PLC meetings, which are the professional learning communities, teachers really have to own the data and understand, you know, where their students are at and where they need to go um, and the, uh, the, the items in between those, those steps in between. So understanding the data, we looked at ISTEP scores, we looked at NWE scores in the past, IREAD scores, those were the things that we really paid attention to in our, sub, our subgroups. What were they great at? What were they really weak in? And so that really allowed us to look at our curriculum and the, uh, the items that needed to be adjusted or actually continued in our curriculum. In addition to that, we looked at our bubble students. So our students who were right on the cusp of possibly passing that ISEP in the last uh, couple of years and just didn't make it. So what did we need to do in order to push them? And those bubble students are the ones that actually got us the most, most growth on our um, ISTEP scores. And the last one was our formative and summative assessments. The teachers really took a hold of that and they were the ones who were the ones creating those items. We also did many assessments in addition to the ones that the district provided us with so that we always had a pulse to where our students were at what they were mastering, and what the um, teachers needed to do in order to make sure that they were, you know, approaching that mastery status. The next one we looked at was our professional development at William McKinley. So last year, we had about 60% of our teachers were brand new to our building. Okay, so IPS was very new to them, and William McKinley was very new to them as well. So with that being said, we had to provide them with some support, okay? So going into the school year, I did a needs assessment, 
You know, I'm talking to my key stakeholders, I'm talking to the teachers, talking to the students, seeing what worked in the past, what's going, uh, what worked and what did not work, and what we needed to do to move forward. So through a lot of anecdotal notes and other information, we compiled pretty much the three focuses for the year. Um, with that professional development, um, with that piece, we were able to, to, to find what professional developments the teachers needed, especially for that 60% that were brand new to our building. Um, we also provided um, non-evaluative walkthrough data, which is what informed our professional developments are, as well. And then we created a shared leadership model. Every person at our building, at William McKinley, is a leader. Um, they're a leader in their classroom, and so are our uh, students. And so just sharing that with everyone and being um, very much a role model. The last thing that we really, really paid attention to was our climate and our culture. We found in our needs assessment that there needed to be a shift. So with that shift, we not only paid attention to our students, but we also paid a lot of attention to our, te our teachers. Um, the first item, though, is the school-wide expectations. We created uh, classroom expectations, hallway expectations, and also normed the code of conduct. The code of conduct, when followed to a T, works. And you know that's how we lowered our out-of-school suspensions. And it provides that equity that all students need, and it's very clear cut. The next one was providing support and our, um, uh, for our teachers and our parents through behavior improvement plans. You know, they're there in place, but how do you implement them? So providing them with the support in order for them to understand how to utilize them um, and the different strategies and the different actual resources that they have in place to use for their students. Um, and the next one was student behavior contracts. So each one of our kids that are uh, uh, kiddos at William McKinley have a behavior contract that gives them those expectations, and they're very aware of where they are. And um, we have school-wide uh, positive incentives for them. We have parties for them. You know, we have color days where everybody wears purple, and so it's a lot of fun. Um, and the last one was just boosting teach mor teacher morale. Our teachers spend more than eight hours at our school every single day, so this is a place where they need to want to come. And so every single day, we make sure that these teachers feel, feel invited. They're, they're invited into our building. They're welcome and it's where they want to be. So with that being said, we have monthly incentives for our teachers. Um, I'm a big health and wellness proponent, and that's one of our initiatives at William McKinley. So we have Zumba. We have a dietitian that comes in and talks to our teachers. They have personal training sessions that are available for them if they want to come out and do that. We also have coffee bars. We have smoothie bars. We have a Christmas party that is going to be tomorrow with one of our community partners at, in Fountain Square. At the end of the year, we have a celebration for our teachers at um, Baker, Baker, and Daniels one of our great community partners, um, up on their 26th floor. It's beautiful, and our teachers feel very appreciated. And so every single step of the way, they're being supported and they're appreciated um, at William McKinley. All right, and so all in all, you know, William McKinley is a great place to be, and the SQR process was awesome in regards to providing me with more support and, and, and showing me what my next steps needed to be. You know, the question was that sustainability, and we had to do our SIP review, and it was very much focused on what can we do for our subgroups and in order to move them, you know, further uh, decreasing the achievement gap. So just creating even more of a focus through the SQR process, through that SIP process was awesome, and I know that we are going to remain a B. You know, you question that sustainability piece. We know our numbers, we know our data, we own it. All of our teachers do, all of our students do, and it's a very clear uh, vision and mission, and they know where we're going. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Bill. I'm going to ask her to stay because I know you all might have questions. He's definitely the highlight um, of the presentation this evening. I mean, I hope what she highlighted is our ability through the school quality review process is to really build that collaborative collaboration between district leaders and school leaders. Um, our job is really to be in service of them and their vision and how they execute against it. And so whenever we can come in and provide them feedback to help them meet their goals, um, that is our intent. And so we want to do that by making sure our schools receive the differentiated supports that are tailored to their specific needs um, in response to the leadership team that's telling us um, what they need to make their schools successful. So I'll take any questions, or Principal Coleman here uh, will as well. Commissioner O'Connor. Lisa, a quick question back sort of in the early part. I don't know what the slide's on, but your, your lens, did we identified lens one and lens two. Just, I think I understood, but I wanted to make sure. So sure. moving from lens one to lens two is actually a narrowing process, right? It's exactly. Uh, uh, rather than widening. So it's fewer schools. That's right. Might be captured by lens one or, or maybe sorted out because of their growth. 
Right. So what we did not want to do is just look at schools with low proficiency because we know there are schools who students may have low proficiency, but you know, as is the case at William McKinley, had tremendous growth. Um, and so we wanted to look at the schools who sort of didn't meet the bar in both of those areas to, to narrow our focus this first year out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner Gore. I just wanted to thank the principal at 39 for her leadership and her compassion that it seems that she is giving to the school and um, look forward to you maintaining your great growth and possibly going higher. Yes, Commissioner Hoops. So comment, just love the, the detail that you provided. It really walked us through um, the changes that you made, how you made them. And oftentimes we get these great summaries of, of a process, but to actually hear the details of how you experienced it and what you put in place uh, it was fantastic. Thank you. I'd like to echo those comments. Appreciate the level of detail on this report. And I think it really um, makes very explicit all of the hard work that your team does and all of the hard work that's happening in our schools. Um, and it, um, you know, we hear kind of a, a lot, some criticism that maybe we just uh, have another strategy in play where we're really kind of moving too quickly to other solutions. But I think that this really paints the picture of just the, the variety of intervention strategies that we're having to try to move all of our schools to a better place. So um, a lot, a lot of hard work. Really appreciate it. And um, the principal, your, your enthusiasm is <laughs> contagious. And it's no wonder your staff is um, highly motivated to do great work with you. So um, thank you very much for all you do for our kids. Great. Thank you. Thank you uh, again, uh, Ms. Coleman. We greatly appreciate your leadership at William McKinley and the work of your team. And we're just excited about the success. And we know that you'll continue that at the helm. Uh, the next uh, report is a transportation update. Uh, commissioners tonight will share our best thinking as relates to uh, possible transportation solutions for the 2018-19 uh, school year. More specifically, we'll address uh, possibilities for our high school choice model as a part of our reinvention of our high school experience. Uh, we are ensuring that all students have access to our uh, academies and, and career pathways. And we wanted to ensure that as we prepare students to be college and career ready, uh, that they have choice in their selections for the coming school year and transportation is a guarantee to that choice. Uh, we also receive feedback from the community and the Board of Commissioners to explore the feasibility of moving our high school students to a, a later start time. Uh, and we shared at that time that would require us to uh, rethink our elementary uh, start and dismissal time as well. And we, we have some thoughts around that that we'll share. In addition to just general bus stop and walking distance information. So we capture uh, a wider scope of what's actually happening in transportation and what we are thinking about could happen. Uh, it's also important to note that this is a particular topic that is in an early phase of exploration. Uh, with this presentation, uh, as we've done in the past, the expectation will be that we go out to the community if, if commissioners are supportive and to get feedback on what's presented tonight as we've done in the past in many ways, whether that's focus group, uh, town hall meetings, surveys, individual uh, school feedback. And so um, if, if that is the next step, we will go forward with that and come back to uh, the Board of Commissioners uh, and share the feedback that we receive and then provide a recommendation how we might go forward with transportation. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to our transportation director, uh, Manny Mendez, who will walk you through our best thinking. Thank you, Dr. Farabee. Thank you, commissioners. Appreciate you having me here to provide an update and the opportunities for the future of transportation. What I'm going to do is just take you through a few ideas that we have and then take you through the tier and let you know what we're trying to accomplish with moving the children to an all-choice high school model and looking at having it at a later start time. So the first thing we want to start looking at is that consolidation of stops and trying to reduce the bus count. There we go. What we're going to do is uh, 
look at four tenths of a mile. That's our current standard. And what we want to do is move that to seven tenths of a mile uh, for just the high schoolers. So from that four tenths to the seven tenths, that's going to consolidate a lot of bus stops for us. It'll also decrease the time uh, for that child's ride on the bus. So we shouldn't be able to make it a little quicker for them. Our drivers also have to contend with very narrow streets. Uh, these are very small streets. You've got parking on both sides of the street. And we want to start to look at ways to avoid those types of roadways and, and allowing our you know, experienced drivers, they do a great job, but let's help them out a little bit uh, in getting those stops onto the secondary roadways. So we're also going to have a very unique opportunity with a uh, single community, but four different destinations uh, for, this, for the high schoolers. So what we're going to look at doing is trying to get a little bit of segregation at the bus stop area. So in other words, I won't have one stop that services all four schools. I'll spread the stops out a little bit so it'll reduce the confusion for the children as they get on and forward for their day's uh, education. Another opportunity we want to look at is that consolidation of stops. And you're going to hear that throughout the presentation. It, it does help save that bus count. But we also want to look at the children that live seven-tenths of a mile from a high school, that that high school will become a bus stop. So that'll help us reduce a lot of travel time around the school area. So that seven-tenths of a mile is becoming very important for that reduction of stops. So we'll look at those opportunities as well. So here's the first look at the tier. Took a lot of months and uh, a lot of reiterations trying to find that balance. So what we're looking at would be the elementary school would have an arrival time of 740. That allows them 20 minutes for breakfast and then a first bell at 8, 8 a.m. And then they would depart at 235 p.m. Our high schoolers will have an arrival time of 920, 20 minute breakfast. So a 9.40 bell time, and then a departure at 4.40. We'll look at our innovation partners uh, to give them an extended day, but we'd want to look at them being on that second tier. And that would help us reduce the variation between the tiers. If you make, take note of the one hour and 40 minutes on the bottom of the slide, that is critical. That is the minimum amount of time that I need to get the buses to and from the children between the tiers. So it's very important that I get that time. So that's how we've designed it. Um, we're looking forward to feedback and looking forward to the community input to help us through this. When we look at our innovation opportunities, we want to offer both tiers to our innovation schools and with the extended PM for any extended days that the innovation schools participate in. We'll also ask uh, for support from the innovation schools for their early departure and half-day schedules to help us work within our tiers. The variation of the tier structure increases the need for additional buses. So the more I can reduce the variation, the more effective and more optimized I brand my fleet. These are points of interest that we're going to need to address. And, and as we develop this process, we're, we're going to look at impacting um, athletics, extracurricular activities, but we're going to find our way around it um, so that we can still provide the children those exceptional services. Of course, the elementary school is going to go early, um, but I, we think we can manage it and have good, uh, good routes dedicated and ready to service those children. We are always concerned about our driver count. Uh, we are affected just like the nation is with a driver shortage. It's a tough job. So we are going to make every effort to improve our hiring process and look at every effort to, to bring more onboarded drivers and attendants. Our drivers are challenged um, with just getting in, getting out, from the schools. So we're going to work with our schools to make sure that we have good departure time and arrival time so that they can get in, get out, and get to the next school of service or to a next program or, or a special run. So we'll work to develop better processes at the school. 
our programs and services other across the district, all we're asking for would be a partnership when we start building our schedule. Let's work within the tiers so that we can optimize our service for the children. So we'll also be looking at making sure that we can provide the evening high school route, make sure we can accommodate any needs there. Um, again, the loading and unloading uh, at the bus stops is going to be huge. Um, and it's when you look at this type of change, we're always going to go through and look at reviews for policies that are impacting transportation. We may have some other recommendations down the road. And then this uh, tier is a draft uh, until we get the student info. Uh, just wanted to present, show you what we've been working on, and any questions you have. Commissioner, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, but just a couple of points um, before um, entertain questions. Um, I just want to go back to highlight that the the hour and 40 minutes is, is the sweet spot that we will be looking for to ensuring that we're able to provide this two-tier model, which is essential to ensuring that we're able to offer the all-choice high school transportation. Uh, so there could be a world where um, the times are reversed, uh, and maybe we don't go into the 2018-19 school year with high school at a later time, uh, perhaps high school um, not as early as they are now, uh, and then a later elementary time. But as we've evolved with our efficiency, we started previously with a unpaired three-tier transportation model, which required more buses, and then we went to a paired three-tier model, which allowed us to reduce the number of buses in our fleet by ensuring that buses serve multiple schools. And now we're looking towards this two-tier model that would provide even greater efficiency because almost all buses would be paired among the two routes between AEM and PM um, by elementary or secondary. It's also important to note we're asking for greater parameters around our innovation partnership with transportation. You recall we, we had um, some reports around some of the challenges with transportation. We believe that we've extended ourselves and we need to provide a box around what we can provide uh, given the level of variation that we have now uh, with those partners. And so I just want to lift that up uh, and, and ensure that, that that was clear in terms of what we're thinking about right now and then what our timeline may be and, and may not be. Mr. O'Connor. One question, Manny, thank you. It's just very helpful. The, the, can you explain uh, either Dr. Farabee or Manny the, the process that we're using to get this out to the public and take input from the public? So as part of our process, first step is to ensure that, one, we bring you um, our thinking and what we're exploring right now. And then um, if commissioners are generally supportive of getting additional feedback, we would spend extensive time in uh, the new year um, between maybe January, February, and March, um, we would hope to have some type of recommendation at the latest in April, uh, which will provide uh, an overview of the input that we receive, who we touch, uh, and then uh, what we believe is the best, you know, next step and course of action based on the input that we receive. Commissioner Arnold. Uh, on slide number four, I just want to make sure I understand so if a student would live within seven-tenths of a mile from, say, Tech, but they wanted to go to Short Ridge, they would go to Tech for their bus stop and then be transported? Correct. Okay. Correct. One thing about that, when we presented this to our Student Advisory Council, um, the high school students uh, gave us feedback that they felt like having a bus stop at a school actually be safer than uh, waiting at a bus stop, um, you know, near their home where they may not be supervision. Now they did ask for awnings for days when it's it's not so great weather, which I think mm -hmm. is a, a great suggestion for us to consider. Um, but I just want to lift that up because we we do have um, a number of students that may be the only person at a bus stop in the morning and afternoon, and we want to lift up safety when we can. Do we do any um, half-day transportation for high school? So if a student wants to be in a particular program, say, that's only offered at tech, one of the career technology 
programs that they go to another school in the morning or do they have to go to tech? How does that, how does that work? Uh, we have some SPED programs that work that way. I don't know if we have true technical classes that transfer uh, from different schools, but I know we do a lot of school-to-school -school transportation as well. Uh, yes, Commissioner Hoops. So uh, you mentioned um, the, the opportunity for comments um, and holding meetings and so on. Have, have, besides the student council, have you had an opportunity to speak to principals, for example, of elementary schools and get their initial feedback already? Uh, because some sc there's a, schools are at, running at different times, uh, certain elementary schools, and wanted to know what the general reaction to the change to an early elementary um, I did meet with the leadership of, of principals. I, I'm not sure what the org, the group is called, but um, yeah, we've we've forwarded on to them. And uh, you know, it's a it's a good challenge. Um, but I, I think what I took from their feedback, um, the high school students will benefit from a later start time. And then, second question related to the changing of times. So you'll, you'll have only a certain number of buses to be able to take that early time. So if you have a lot of innovation schools that might want to have an earlier time, I mean, you have sort of the max, correct? So correct. A certain number. Uh, so you'll have to make adjustments to those schools that just won't be able to because you might have received many interests in, in the earlier time or a later time, what have you. That's correct. And, and that's why that hour and 40 minutes in the pairing is, is so important. Commissioner Gore. Looking at slide four and talking about limit bus stops on narrow and short streets and possible. I've noticed that and it is horrible. However, what will our students do then? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't quite understand. When um, they live in those particular. Um, all we're looking to do is extend that walking distance as necessary to avoid those streets. So if, if the, it's a mid street stop and it's very narrow, um, as long as it's not a SPED or IEP um, transportation need, then all we would do is looking at expanding that, that um, pickup point to, to a secondary. Walking. Yeah, still walking distance, but um, I've, I've got to help my drivers out. The, the question uh, around, you know, principals and elementary students, you know, we, we have, similar to the Student Advisory Council, we have a Principal Advisory Group that, that gives us guidance. And, um, you know, I think this is one of those situations where um, there'll probably be good arguments on both sides. Um, if we change schedule for high school students, we ultimately would be changing the schedule for elementary students. Uh, so this may be one of the cases where you may have um, applause on one side and, and not applause on the other side. and. Um, it's a change in schedule for families, and so we will continue to look at after and before school care, uh, ensuring that we, we think about all of the uh, implications of, of this type of change. But it's also important to note that as a part of our current three-tier model, we had elementary schools move to an earlier tier. So there's already a group of elementary schools that have already moved to an earlier start, and we don't hear... Um, many complaints or concerns as it relates to that move, but we do know as if, if we were to make this change, more families would be impacted. Uh, and as I stated earlier, uh, we have to find the right time to make this transition if we determine that, you know, there's more need for uh, child care uh, at schools that may have um, a significant portion of students that may uh, be alone in the morning or the afternoon, uh, we may need to work through how we would support those families and then, and then make the transition at a later time. But we are at a point that we want to ensure that we, we have a decision for the school year in a timely manner. And to offer all of the high school students their option, we will have to move to a two-tier in some way. Yeah, there's going to be families that are going to have very big swings. Mr. O'Connor. One, one question with regards to 740 start time. Do we, and you may not know the answer to this, but do we have a, a, an estimation of what the, so if we have a 740 start time, what the earliest a student would have to be at a, at a bus stop to meet a 740 start time? So if you look at the 140, um, 
we've we've got some stops that are about an hour and ten, or some routes that are about an hour and ten minutes. Um, our average is just about an hour or less for for the normal route. Um, we don't anticipate too much of a shift, so I would say maybe as early as maybe six ten, um, but somewhere around in there. But it'll also um, We'll have to see the traffic patterns, how it's going to work. And with the elementary schools being more community-based, I think our ride time will be reduced. But I've got to see the data. And um, I've actually sent drivers out riding at that time of day just to make sure I, you know, that I had a good pulse on what was happening uh, on my route. So I, I feel pretty confident we, we will be able to reduce a little bit of that drive time um, for that AIM route. Still need a little clarification on why innovation status is necessarily relevant. Um, if, if it's an innovation elementary school that runs on a similar schedule to any of our other elementaries, isn't that more relevant than the fact that it's an innovation? Um, if it's an innovation school that's on our current tier structure, um, mm -hmm. then it's fine. That there is there is no no issue. It's only if there is an innovation okay. that is outside of okay, the Okay, because that, that's a little confusing time. to me because it makes it look like there's something unique about that status that would push it into that category. Um, just I, that... I understand. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Commissioners, the next section is unfinished business, and uh, the only item in that section is 7.01, which is authorization to submit an uh, opt-out waiver uh, for the State Board of Accounts. Um, I had intended to, since Commissioner Honor raised the, the question around the, uh, the audit uh, that we requested from the Council of Great City Schools to help us with our financial transparency, which included this recommendation for uh, annual auditing and to establish an audit committee with uh, board members and community members with expertise in finance. Uh, I thought I would read to you all the 12 recommendations and describe what we've done, but I won't do that tonight because of time. They've all left uh, anyway. So. But we will we'll, uh, make this request um, that's aligned with that recommendation. Uh, to ensure that we continue to uh, be good stewards, not only with the transparency, but this will also help the district with its um, debt ratings and just overall uh, financial status and an opportunity to engage more people actually in the auditing process um, with our checks and balances. So with that, we ask that commissioner uh, consider this item for action uh, and your materials as re resolution number 7769. We ask that commissioners consider this resolution for approval. Do I have a motion to approve resolution number 7769 authorizing the administration to submit an opt-out request to the State Board of Accounts as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Next section is new business. These are items that were presented on a Tuesday evening uh, that are requesting that commissioners consider for approval. The first is item 8.01, which is a request for a out-of-country field trip. We ask that commissioners approve this request as presented. Do I have a motion to approve the out-of-country field trip as presented? So moved. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? The motion carries. The next item is item 8.02, request for a declaration of real property, requesting that commissioners approve uh, our request to declare surplus real property no longer needed for school purposes as presented. Um, I'm recusing myself from voting on item 8.02, the surplus declaration of real property. Vice President O'Connor, would you call for a vote on resolution number 77? Do I have a motion to approve resolution number 770 approving 7770 approving the surplus declaration of real property as presented? So moved. Second. 
I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, noting the uh, recusal of President Sullivan. The next item is item 8.03, which requests to approve partnership agreements with Indianapolis Teaching Fellows and Teach for America to support the district with teacher candidates. We ask that commissioners approve these agreements as presented. Do I have a motion to approve the services agreement as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. I believe that uh, completes our regular um, agenda, other than any closing comments that commissioners would like to offer at this time. Yes, Commissioner Arnold. Uh, as this is our last meeting of the year, I would just like to thank Commissioner Sullivan for her leadership in this past year. Uh, it's been a very busy year, sometimes a very trying year. We've, we've gone through some big issues, so very much appreciate your leadership. And thank you. Just concurring thoughts. Um, you have worked as hard this year, Madam President, but uh, appreciate your leadership. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the time everybody has taken on this board. It has been a, a difficult year, and uh, thank you. Thank you all for your service. Commissioner Hoops. I would also like to thank you, uh, especially uh, new to the board. You were always accessible and available to me as I needed additional information or a clear understanding of some of these issues. So I really appreciate your. Commissioner Gore. I too have been on just a very short time, but I'd like to thank you for your leadership. You're always very kind and open when I get called for questions or whatever. I call a lot sometimes. So. <laughs> I love your calls. Thank you. Um, yes, I, it's, it's been a, a real honor and a privilege and a joy to do this work with all of you and um, look forward to continuing working from um, hopefully another position on this um, table. So. Um, I just want to wish all of our staff at this time also really happy holidays. Um, hope all of the kids, all of the families, all of you get lots of rest, um, lots of family time, um, and, and have a wonderful holiday break. Um, Dr. Farabee? Again, I, I'd echo all the comments. Um, just celebrating the leadership of uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, I won't, again, because of the time of the hour, just go through all of that. Um, we've, we've seen and done and accomplished together, but um, I am very grateful that we, I've had opportunity to, to share this time with you as a leader of, of our governance team. And uh, I, I commend commissioners uh, and time and time again, uh, the ability to make tough decisions to ensure that uh, our students and our families receive the support services uh, that they have a right to and should have access to. And um, I, again, I just am grateful that you continue to, to stand in the gap for our students who need more. If not, then our next meeting will be our organization day on Monday, January 8th, meeting at 6 p.m. in this room. The meeting stands adjourned.